Good evening. This is Chairwoman Jane Lichter. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, January 10th, 2023. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Rawa Hassan. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on bcps.tv, Comcast channel 73, Verizon channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the January 10th agenda. Um, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Ms. Domanowski? Yes, I'd like to make a motion. Um, I'd like to remove contract CWA-114-23 from new business contract awards until further information and a presentation can be brought before the full board, and the full board is given the opportunity to question and discuss this contract. Second, Ms. Hen. Any discussion? Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Lichter. Uh, this contract was discussed in the Building and Contracts Committee last night and it was approved by the Building and Contracts Committee. Uh, I think it is premature to remove it because the studies have been conducted by the Department of Transportation. We can certainly ask for the information. Um, there was a 12-year study. We are required by Maryland state law to start our electrification of, the, of our uh, transportation buses. Montgomery County already has initiated it and um, it is a win-win situation. This is something that's required by state and federal law. So I do not support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Ms. Hassan. I'd like to agree with Ms. Joes. It is essential that we begin the discussion and approval um, of ensuring that our schools are environmentally sustainable, making sure that our school buses are up to Maryland state law, making sure that we are moving towards the right direction and becoming zero waste, and, we, and making sure that our energy is put in the right places. Um, so for those reasons, I think it is essential that we begin approving these contracts. Um, if you wanted additional information, I recommend that you watch the Buildings and Contracts Committee from last night and the discussion on that. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. Ms. Hen? Thank you. Um, so I participated in that meeting last night, and in the interest of time, we did not um, have a full discussion. However, I did ask Dr. Grimm if um, he would be willing to bring um, a presentation to the board. I also asked him about the timeliness of moving forward with this contract now. Um, he indicated that we did not receive EPA grant funding in the first round but that he expected a more um, positive result in the second round of grant funding. And I asked him whether it was necessary to move on this contract immediately, to which he responded no. So I would support this motion because um, of the lack of timeliness now. Um, I believe that the board can receive a presentation prior to taking action on this. I do support this contract overall. However, um, I had several questions um, and would rather have the information presented before um, taking action on it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Uh, thank you. I, I, I support the electrification of our fleet, but I want more information about it. And I had a number of questions about this, regardless of whether it passed in contracts or not. So I would hope that we could have a presentation about it so the public you know, could learn more about it also. Um, and since there is no immediate need, since we were not selected by the EPA in the first round, 
for any grant funding whatsoever for this. There is nothing that is forcing us to vote on this tonight. Thank you. Ms. Jemanowski. Uh, yes, um, this is a $43 million contract awarded to one bidder. Several questions were raised during the contract meeting last night um, that I don't believe were properly addressed. While I do understand the need for new school buses, especially if those buses come with cameras and seatbelts, my concern with these proposed electric buses that will cost more than double that of a traditional diesel school bus is the admitted limitations of these particular buses. As stated in the meeting, these buses will require new and specific charging stations, and they can only travel a certain number of miles on a full charge. Mr. Hartlove stated that these electric buses will not be able to place all Baltimore County school buses for this reason. I believe more information on just how many electric buses BCPS realistically needs and will be able to use without putting a further burden on our already stressed and stretched thin transportation system. I also do not believe this is an urgent contract that needs to be awarded tonight as there is still grant funding available for this that has not been applied for yet. Mr. McMillian, do you have a question? Discussion. Yeah, I'm not sure if there was a second, if we went right into discussion. Um, there was a second. Ms. Hen seconded. Okay, I didn't hear that. Thank okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Ms. Harvey. So the Building and Contracts Committee voted to move this contract forward based on the information that was presented. Uh, it was made clear that electric buses that our transportation system would not be 100 percent electric for those specific reasons that you mentioned Ms. Dominowski. I'm not sure that that precludes uh, the system from beginning the process of starting to obtain electric buses and for those reasons I support the decision of the Building and Contracts Committee to move this contract forward. Thank you. Ms. Jose? Thank you. Uh, there were several questions that were answered, and Dr. Grimm is here during building and contracts to address additional questions. Uh, in Maryland, many jurisdictions are rec have already started the process towards a zero emissions electric school buses. Like I said, Montgomery County is one of them. In March, Maryland also passed a law requiring all new school buses purchases be electric by 2025. It's 2023. Uh, Maryland buses typically have a 12-year operating life by law. BCPS transports approximately 80,000 students every day and we average 14 million miles a year. As an environmental engineer, this is uh, something that I passionately believe going towards zero emissions. You have questions, you can ask them. Staff is always available. Uh, but just because you don't understand something, to pull something and not realize that climate action is needed and it's happening right now, uh, to kick the can down the road, we will be failing our future generation. So um, I feel strongly that we should move forward with this contract and we can always address questions. And for the record, anybody that has questions prior to the building and contracts, they can always send those questions in and have them answered by staff or attend the building and contracts committee. Thank you. Thanks. Last comment, Ms. Dominowski. I just wanted to reiterate that I'm not trying to kick the environmental uh, problem down the road. I'm trying to um, understand how we um, award $43 million to one bidder. Okay, one more. Mr. McMillian? If, if time is not the critical piece, why don't we receive more information that we can share with everybody, the people out here, us? You know, what's wrong with sharing more information if the timing is not critical? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So the motion was to remove, okay, right, I'm just going to, to remove CWA 11423, the electrification of school buses um, and postpone to a future meeting. May I have a roll call vote, Ms. Gover? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Joes? No. Ms. Harvey? No. Ms. Hassan? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Dr. Savoy? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? No. Favor is five. So the motion fails, so it remains on the agenda. Okay. Um, The 
first item on the agenda, it, oh, we did that one, oops, sorry. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent on the following personnel matters. Retirements, resignations, leaves, deceased recognition of service, certificate appointments for that uh, terminations being removed from tonight's agenda. Thank you. Do I have a motion? Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibit D2, right, D2 through D6? So moved, Harvey. Do I have a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Henn? Yes. Ms. Jones? Abstain. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Abstain. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favor is nine. The motion passes. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and the members of the board, I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Senior Operations Supervisor, Grounds in the Office of Facilities Support Services, and Staff Attorney, Office of Law. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibits E1? So moved. Do I have a second? Second, Hassan. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favors 11. Motion carries. Mr. I mean, Dr. Williams. Our first appointment is Stephen R. Ruth as the Senior Operations Supervisor, Grounds Office of Facility Support Services. He's watching virtually. Uh, just recently, he served as the Supervisor of Grounds Office, uh, Grounds in the Office of Facility Support Services. He brings to us over 36 years of service. And previously to this most recent position, he served as the field representative in the of grounds in the Department of Physical Facilities, foreman of grounds. He also served as a crew chief of concrete and groundsman of maintenance of Log Raven, also Dundalk Maintenance Shop. And he started his career in 1986 as a custodian at Sandalwood Elementary. Congratulations, Mr. Ruth, who's watching virtually. We can still clap if you so choose. And our last candidate is Cameron A. Williams as the staff attorney in the Office of Law. Welcome to BCPS. He previously served as an associate attorney for Mulanazi Law Office. Um, previously to that, he served as a legal analyst a program analyst, a child support program specialist, again, a legal analyst, a health insurance specialist, and a contract analyst. So welcome, Mr. Williams, to Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you. I'm sorry, I refreshed and it, okay. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. 
The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who register to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who register will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personnel remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. I ask speakers to observe the three minute time clock which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear this, the tone or see that your time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under the Board of Education Participation by the Public. I will now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Mr. Billy Burke, um, speaking on behalf of CASE. Good evening, Chairwoman, Mrs. Lichter, Vice Chair, Mrs. Harvey, Superintendent, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you on behalf of the members of CASE. In its simplest terms, your role as school board members is to ensure that the students of Baltimore County Public Schools are prepared to live, work, and compete in a global world. You do that in three important ways. One, you hire the superintendent. Two, you provide governance for policies aligned to the vision and mission of the school system and community members. And three, you provide governance for the budget by approving the proposed budget and monitoring expenditures through the contracts process. I still believe the process for creating and approving the budget with you and the county and executive and county council is convoluted, but that speech is for another night. Tonight you will hear the superintendent's proposed budget. Not everything can be accomplished in one budget year. It's important to have a clear, phased approach that allows you to react to new state and federal mandates and includes improving buildings and infrastructure, as well as the implementation of new curriculum. The goal of the budget is to improve academic performance for all students. The goal of the budget is to remove predictable barriers that impact students because of their race, poverty level, ability to speak English, and participation in special education services. There are many priorities that compete for the budget. It will be important for you to understand short-term and long-term plans for implementing those priorities. The budget priorities for CASE remain constant. One, fair compensation and benefits while maintaining work-life balance. Two, professional development based on research and evidence-based practices that improve leadership, instruction, and student behavior. Three, processes that are communicated, efficient, and transparent for managing human resources, payroll, and the employee and retiree services. Four, a plan for addressing the staffing crisis that includes recruitment, retention, and operating within available resources and innovating new ways of providing access. And finally, number five, prioritizing staff for students receiving special education services and historically underserved or underperforming communities. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak on behalf of CASE. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Our next speaker is Cindy Sexton speaking for TEPCO.
Good evening, Chair Lecter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. As we await the report on the operating budget tonight, I'd like to once again highlight the need we have to recruit and retain educators for our students. This has been my message since my first day as TEPCO president. Our students cannot afford to have a revolving door of educators, yet we have already lost almost 200 educators this school year alone. We must work together to recruit and retain educators for our students. What does working together look like? It looks like working with educators to reduce extraneous workloads so we can focus on instruction. It looks like enough mental health professionals in our schools to work with the students who need support, to, to do all we can as a system and as a society to avoid situations such as the one at Lansdowne High today. It looks like making sure that no educator leaves Baltimore County to go to another district because pay or benefits are better. It looks like every single person who has an input or say in the budget process, making sure it is an educator first budget. We can't say that we're for the students and we want to be a world-class school system if we shortchange the very people we need to make that so. Our educators must be the priority in this budget. It looks like the salary compression that we need to increase the career earnings of our educators so they stay in Baltimore County. The health of our county, the health of our school system, and the heart of our society demand that we do this so our students can grow and learn and be the productive members of our communities we want them to be. There are so many forces at work trying to divide us as a society, as a nation, as a county, and it can be easy to become discouraged or distracted. Don't let that happen. The staffing shortage affects the academic achievement, emotional wellness, and the safety of our students. Surely we can all agree that those three things are paramount and our work and resources must be focused on that. Teaching is a hard job, but it is a work of the heart. We, the educators in the room, and all those we represent, we want to be here for students, but we need the commitment from you that you will work to truly affect the changes needed to not only retain the educators we have, but recruit those new educators. Our students can't wait, but our educators can't wait either. Make the commitment to authentically work for us, for our students, for our society, and for our future. Thank you. Thank you. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Sharon Serhoff. That was good timing. <laughs> I'm going to give you my, the uh, bullet points, and then I'll elaborate as time allows me. Uh, my name is Sharon Saroff. For those of you who don't know me, I am a special education advocate in the community, and I have the majority of my clients in Baltimore County. Um, and we are talking about the budget. So these are areas that I feel, and my clients feel, need improvement. One, um, and I know this is already there, IEP facilitators for every elementary school. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for putting that there. We need to put back central IEP meetings. Three, um, the VLP needs to be expanded to include students who get their IEP services outside the general education classroom. Four, resource teachers. We need to have teachers in school buildings that can assist students during the day, not just in the afternoon or evening or whenever, with services. Um, we need to have better special transportation we need somebody who is going to be in charge of these 2E kids. 2E means twice exceptional. These are kids who have both IEPs and are gifted intellectually, and you're talking to one right now. Why do I feel these are necessary? 
I think that the amount of state complaints that we have currently speak for themselves. I've had to deal with several of them. I dealt with one today. Um, I'm going to emphasize three areas currently in the time I have left that central IEP needs to come back. It is a way for parents to resolve things and not have to go to a state complaint or have to go to mediation. Not everything can be resolved in the schoolhouse. We need to have better special transportation. That's a safety issue. If my child needs to be dropped off at my house, that means at my house, not in the middle. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amy Adams. Good evening, everyone. As we begin the budget season, I hope this new board will focus on BCPS's number one priority, the students, and your mission, educating every student. I'm curious, do you all know what the percentage of children who are capable of being taught to read by the end of first grade is? Research shows it's 95% of all kids. Only about 5% of children have severe cognitive limitations and struggle with reading throughout their lives. But according to the Ready to Read Act report given in Curriculum Committee in October, there are 41 and 42% of all BCPS ki kindergarten and first graders not reaching benchmarks by the end of the year. I've been listening to a podcast called Extraordinary Districts hosted by the Education Trust, Karen Chenoweth. She was invited to speak to, by the Superintendent Chaudhary at the MSDE board meeting this past March. As I listened to the interviews of leaders from all different school districts all around the country, large, small, rural, urban, high poverty, what seems to be a theme for systems who are showing measurable improvements and closing gaps between subgroups of students include a belief that all children can learn, a focus on factors that school systems have control over, Avoiding the poor baby syndrome attitude, which I would be happy to elaborate on if I had a little more time. A use of data to understand shortfalls and adjust instruction. There needs to be a sense of urgency because time is not on our side. Focus on shorter term 90 day plans of action rather than five year strategic plans. A belief that good in, a good environment for students is the same as a good environment for teachers. A focus on early ed reading instruction that includes emphasis not only on phonics, but decoding and a strong vocabulary to expose and build students' background knowledge, which can help avoid the fourth grade slump and improve reading comprehension development. Training all levels of educators to be able to teach reading instruction. Because currently only a third of BCPS students read on grade level, our middle school and high school teachers would be able to address the needs of the students that are in front of them. Use a reading interventional list in the early years, even pre-K, in the whole classroom to take a preventative approach rather than a needs-based approach. Develop principal training. When early intervention and reading instruction is effective, schools will see a decrease in discipline problems and special education referrals. One novel idea is that kids can move out of special education programs and it could just be a temporary placement. When leaders provide the belief in a strategy and define academic objectives, he or she can get people to mobilize around that and success is possible. If a school system is using something that doesn't work year after year after year, it's because they never really believe these kids could learn and be successful. And if there's no improvement over time, for example, nine years, then there is something wrong with what the adults are doing. Mobilized districts are unfaithful to programs or curricula and will drop what isn't working or showing positive Thank you. Next is Janelle Wurstrom. Good evening. Good evening. 
Um, I'm Janelle Wallstrom. I'm a parent of two students at Hampton Elementary, and I'm here to request an emergency boundary study to be completed for Hampton Elementary School. I speak on behalf of teachers, staff, PTA members, current parents, and prospective parents. We are extremely concerned, and we are asking for this emergency boundary study and for it to be implemented for the 2023-2024 school year. Hampton is currently at 121% capacity and in need in severe need of relief. Hampton has a state rated capacity of 670 students. When the school year ended just last June, we had 721 students. Currently, we have over 800 students. We have more students being enrolled every week. In fact, since we got back in January, we have 12 new students that have registered. At Hampton, resources have dwindled and physical space has simply run out. Special teachers are regularly, sh regularly sharing classrooms. Resource teachers use spots in the faculty room to plan. Our gym and cafeteria are tight. Lunch is run until 1.40 p.m. Our p um, parents are coming in daily to volunteer and help with lunches. There are three sets of group bathrooms for 800 students, which is obviously difficult to monitor and to navigate. Paraeducators and other support staff are being shuffled all over the school. And while they truly do a fantastic job, they cannot be everywhere they are needed to be. It's physically impossible. We have one nurse and one guidance counselor for over 800 students, which is unacceptable for the physical and mental well-being of our children. To quote some of the BCPS core values, learning is a core purpose and effective teaching is the most essential factor in student learning. If BCPS truly believes these core values, which I believe you do and we do, then I hope you can see why we need your support. Our student to teacher ratio is impacted by our current and steadily increasing enrollment. Teachers cannot be expected to help or connect with students in any type of individualized manner in classes like Hampton has, especially when their numbers are in flux. We have six kindergarten classes, for example, and they have 20 sorry, they have 25 to 27 students in the classes. And the Maryland board says that there should be 22 students to one teacher. Keeping proper classroom management also is difficult at these ratios and would be for the most seasoned teacher. We are all here because we believe in education and I am sure we can all agree that students should be given quality and equitable attentive education. Please grant Hampton this emergency boundary study for our future and for our students. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferron. Good evening. I have a little throat problems. So. Okay. Oh. Good evening to all. Last board meeting, the honorable and energetic coordinator told you that policy 1230 had a good run. The fact is, policy 1230 was revamped in August of 2020. Also, the policy really, uh, also the coordinator told you that the student member is the most important in her opinion. Um, How many times have you seen the chairs come to you? I know you are a little bit new, five or six of you. But in the past seven months of the chair of the central area came one time. Northwest, few times. Southwest, a lot. Marlena is my favorite. Northeast, have you seen Northeast? Do you know the name? So. The point is that Comar asked for educational area advisory councils and it's really not being implemented. The policy says that the chair is the one person elected among the education area advisory councils. Are you sure the elections of the chair are free and fair? Coordinator. The policy says the coordinator is appointed by the board to oversee the activity. Oversee means to look, to observe, to report. Look at the minutes on the website. 
Do you see someone there coordinating between different ESCs? Do you see in the minute that there is overseeing? I leave that up to you. These education advisory councils are made to advise the board, to be a conduit. I call ourselves as ambassadors, connection with the community. I don't see that. The coordinator has been at the helm for six years, and blaming the policy is like a jockey blaming a horse when the problem is in the jockey itself. At the end of the day, I love the word governance that Mr. Burke alluded to. You are the governor of this educational system. Comar says make EAC and it needs to be run effectively. That's what I ask you. It is not. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Clarissa Taylor Jackson. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I have my notes. Okay. To the chair, superintendent, and members of this board, good evening. I am Clarissa Taylor Jackson, the basilisk or president of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, the Zeta Omega Sigma chapter. My sorority and historic an historically black sorority, which was founded by seven educators, celebrated 100 years of greater service, greater progress to the world in November. In March, Zeta Omega Sigma is celebrating 35 years of service to Baltimore County. The members of my chapter, some of whom teach in Baltimore County classrooms, um, are honored that we have the opportunity to support county students. Um, through our service just this year alone, in the last six months, or in, in the next eight, um, rather, we collected over 100 book bags filled with school supplies for students at Johnny Cake Elementary in Catonsville. Um, we are preparing to empower middle school and high school students to support their own physical and mental well-being um, at an event that we are planning, which is our annual youth symposium at Dundalk High School Sollers Point. Um, and we have other activities planned for county schools, uh, county students, but my chapter isn't alone. Um, here with me are, is another member of the Divine Nine, um, uh, Phi Beta Sigma members who will be coming up behind me, but my chapter is one of several who are operating in the county whose business it is to support each other, to support um, fellow uh, students, uh, black students in the community, all Baltimore County students, but specifically, um, we want to do good work, support the teachers in your classrooms. We want to support the students in your out of school time programming. And so I would hope that as you are becoming acclimated with your, your new jobs that you would consider, um, the great work that the over a thousand plus members of the Divine Nine, which we affectionately call it, NPAC members are here to help your students are here to help your admin, your teachers, everyone who's connected to the um, to your schools. And I'm saying this as both president of Zeta Omega Sigma chapter and president of the National Panhellenic Council Metropolitan Baltimore NPHC. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak before you. Um, I hope that you can um, be good stewards of the time and the energy that you have to support your students and the uh, faculty and staff who bring um, issues before your board. I'm actually just trying to fill my time, but anyway. <laughs> well, thank Good you. evening. I, I'm too excited. <laughs> Anyhow, I will give you back my time. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Matthew Lilly. All right. Good evening. My name is Matthew Lilly. Uh, I am the director of education of the Epsilon New Sigma chapter of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. I am joined here tonight with our president of our chapter, along with a bunch of hosts that we also have watching online. Uh, our chapter has been operating in Baltimore County since 1972. Uh, we celebrated 50 years of service in Baltimore County just last year. And our fraternity yesterday just celebrated 109 years of brotherhood, scholarship, and service across the world. 
Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated has three programs, Bigger and Better Business, Social Action, and Education. As Director of Education of our chapter, I want to make sure that we are a viable partner with BCPS. As an educator myself, I know the importance of having community partners assist with programs, mentoring, and activities with your schools. Now that we are back to our new normal, we are looking forward to get more engaged with the schools in our community. Last July, I had the opportunity to attend a partnership fair uh, where we made connections with over 60 schools and also had an opportunity to talk to several representatives to talk about our programs and initiatives that our uh, chapter has to offer. Since that time, we've been able to host a back to school drive, which all the supplies that we have, we were able to donate to those schools that we met at the partnership fair. Uh, we were able to assist Lock Raven High School with their senior mock interview day, as well as Helen Thorpe uh, Elementary's Save the Warmth, which they were able to collect 50 coats and several pair of shoes that were donated. As your partner in Baltimore County, we've already began discussions with certain schools to talk about how we can help assist them with uh, the celebration of our Black History Month. Uh, we've also talked and been in discussions about having a FAFSA financial aid and freshman 101 seminars. Um, in addition to that as well, we also look to prepare to launch our 2023 Leaders of the Future Scholarship that we offer to graduating high school seniors in the Baltimore County area. Um, information about that scholarship can be found at pbs-ens1972.org. So as you can see, our chapter offers numerous uh, amounts of educational programs, and I appreciate the opportunity that we have to share what we do with the larger audience. It's my hope that this opportunity allows us to maximize the impact that we're able to give to the students in the BCPS school system. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Williams, the distinguished board members, and Mr. Baysmore for allowing me to share with you a little bit about the work that Epsilon Lu Sigma Chapter of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated is able to do in our county. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And our last speaker is Robin Campbell. Good evening. Hi. Good evening, Superintendent Williams and members of the board. Uh, I want to begin by congratulating those of you who are new, including Maggie Litz Dominowski, who represents the district where I live, and recognizing those who are returning. Like many others across Baltimore County, I'm hopeful that your tenure marks an era of cooperation and problem solving. Among the problems that need immediate solving is the severe and accelerating overcrowding at Hampton Elementary School in Lutherville. Three years ago, this facility underwent a boundary study that officials predicted would send approximately 100 additional students to the school. Sadly, this prediction was way off. Hampton is built to accommodate 670 students. Before the 2020 study, it was operating at 80% of capacity. As of this month, it is operating at 121% of capacity with 800 children enrolled. That is an increase of 51% over just three years, and it does not include the many families that have opted out of the public school because of the overcrowding. This situation is going to get worse. Only two miles away, for example, developers propose to build an additional 400 housing units at Lutherville Station. What does this look like in the classroom? Four years ago, Hampton had four kindergarten classes. This year, there are six. Absent your intervention, next year there will be six more. The building does not have enough classrooms for so many students. So this year's kindergartners, as first graders, will likely see 30 to 35 seven-year-olds per class. There will be similar numbers in other grades. We all know that overcrowding undermines learning, the very thing we are all here to promote. In addition, specialized services, things like counseling and speech therapy, will be rationed. I have heard anecdotally that they already are. This is not a critique of Mrs. Kaiser or Ms. Grissel or any of the teachers and staff. It is purely a matter of numbers. 
A school can take only so much stress before it causes collateral actions. Already, I have watched my children's friends transfer to private schools or move to distant communities. Teachers and staff are leaving. If you do not act, this will accelerate. BCPS's own forecasts project a peak of 773 students in 2025, followed by slight declines through 2031. Obviously, these projections are wrong and need to be revised. Public education is a jewel of our society, our strength as a nation, the source of our prosperity, and it binds us together as one people. You have volunteered to be re responsible for this precious system. As a first step and as a show of your commitment, I urge you to authorize an emergency boundary system study to fix this problem before the next school year. I also urge you to use this process to reflect upon the systemic issues that are overcrowding schools throughout Baltimore County. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Board Lichter, uh, Board Chair Lichter, uh, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board. I am pleased to present my superintendent's report to the board and team BCPS. So this report will, will include celebrations, updates, evidence of our strategic plan, the compass, our pathway to excellence in action. So first, I would like to wish all members of Team BCPS a happy new year. Next slide, please. I am grateful um, to be a part of an engaged community committed to student success. So I look forward to what we can accomplish together in this new year. We know that our efforts to heal, rebuild, and recover must be ongoing. We will continue to move forward to meet the needs of Team BCPS. That's why we have a renewed focus on academic achievement and partnerships in BCPS. We know that we can't do this work alone, so thank you for your support of our system. Thursday, January 12th, is Team BCPS Day. All BCPS stakeholders are encouraged to wear blue and post photos on social media using hashtag BCPSBlue. Awards will be presented for photo creativity. We want to celebrate the unity and strength of our system. Please join us in honoring the dedication and perseverance of our students, teachers, staff, parents, caregivers, volunteers, and supporters. In observance of Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, all BCPS schools and officers are closed on January 16th, 2023. While our schools will host many celebratory and service-related activities this week, I encourage all members of Team BCPS to take part in the day of service by giving back to our communities. Save the date. The Education Foundation of Baltimore County Public Schools has announced that State of the Schools 2023 will be held on Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023 at Towson University CQ Arena. This event showcases and recognizes the many accomplishments of our students and educators. We are pleased to see the return of this in-person event after three years. Sponsorship details are available through the Education Foundation of BCPS. All right, mark your calendar for the important dates. Students, second marking period ends and early release day is January 17th. Report card distribution on January 25th. The 2023 BCPS Stakeholder Survey opens January 30th through March 3rd and our special education teacher recruitment event will happen on February the 2nd. Coming soon, we are very close to the opening of a new customer service center on the Greenwood campus to respond daily to employee and retiree needs. Walk in, email, phone support will be provided Monday through Friday, Monday through Friday with two evenings per week. Interviews are underway for 12 full-time customer service representatives four to six part-time customer service representatives, and one supervisor. Details about the center's grand opening will be shared with Team BCPS. 
This is a practice in other similarly sized systems, and we look forward to bringing one to BCPS. So during the principal's leadership development meeting, I shared with principals our mutual desire to gather their input regarding the upcoming budget. The survey asked principals to identify three top three priorities, excuse me, for fiscal year 2024. The survey responses were solicited in three categories, school base, centralized, and operating budget resources. 120 principals responded to the survey, representing 78 elementary schools, 19 middle schools, 14 high schools, and nine special schools and centers. So the top three school-based resources identified by principals were additional teachers to reduce class size, staff development teachers for professional learning, and school-based math resource teachers. Based on this strong feedback from principals, the proposed budget includes a request for additional staff in classrooms and math support in alignment with state funding guidelines. We will continue to explore creative ways to use existing grant funding sources to support school-based professional learning needs. The top three centralized resources identified principals by principals were social workers, psychologists, and pupil personnel workers. These requests are aligned with what staff has shared as their needs during our school visits. Two of these positions will help to respond to the growing social emotional needs of our students. The proposed budget includes the expansion of community schools with wraparound supports for families. All members of Team BCPS were invited to complete an FY24 budget priority survey. 3,004 respondents completed the survey and provided feedback. When building a local school budget, the community identified the top three budget priorities as hiring and retaining qualified teachers. Keep class size small, teacher to student ratio, and providing support services to struggling students. The top three school system budget priorities identified by the community are student teacher ratio, social emotional behavior, health and safety of students, and instructional materials. The top priority identified by, by the community was expanding opportunities to improve our system. The FY24 budget proposal addresses all of these areas in alignment with our student performance data. So this concludes my report. Thank you for your attention, and we will continue to update the board, our community, and team BCPS. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Next on the agenda is the chair report. And I did not know what Dr. Ferron was going to talk about, but I am going to spend the next couple of minutes talking about the Area Education Advisory Councils. Policy 1230 states that the Board of Education of Baltimore County believes that Area Education Advisory Councils exist to improve the quality of education in Baltimore County and to strengthen the relationship between the school system and the community by serving as informed advisors to the board on public school issues and by promoting interest and involvement in the school system. Our five advisory councils are coordinated. Did you know that Baltimore County well, Public Schools not yet. has five? Thank you. Our five advisory councils are coordinated by Donna Sibley, and each has a chair and sometimes a vice chair who coordinate the work of the councils and plan their monthly meetings. Marlena Colton -Pier um, Purcell is chair of Southwest, Jackie Brewster is Southeast, Tiffany Smith is Northeast, Dr. LaShawn Stitt is Northwest, and Elisa Alonzo is Central. I have had the opportunity to attend several area adv education advisory council meetings in December and also in January, actually two of them last night. And I recently met with Donna and the five chairs and one of the vice chairs. Topics that the advisory council meetings have included are operating pre-budget meetings, social emotional learning, discipline and safety, grading and reporting, volunteering and getting active in BCPS, college and career readiness, nutrition, transportation, and magnet programs. And there's a lot more topics, but those are some that they've organized. I'd like to publicly thank each one of them for all of the work that they are doing on behalf of the advisory councils. Their passion for advocating for their communities is obvious. In addition to the work that they're doing for their individual 
councils, they are and have contributed their time and knowledge by serving on many, many BCPS committees. The Calendar Committee, Reopening Committee, Blueprint for Maryland's Future Committee, the Equity Advisory Council, Chief Academic Officer, it goes, it goes on and on. Despite the hard work taking place, there is a lack of awareness by the public surrounding the AEACs, the work they do, and their capacity to advocate on behalf of students and families in their respective communities. Meeting dates and locations can be found on the system's website. Some meetings are virtual and some are conducted through Zoom. Even though the advisory councils are organized by geographical areas, the public is welcome to attend any of the area meetings, especially if the topic is of interest. It is my hope that as a new board, we can take a more active role in supporting and utilizing these councils. They are intended to be the board's connection and link to the voices of our parent communities. At this time, I would like to share a video that has been created by the advisory councils um, and is starring the chair of the Southwest Advisory Council, Marlena Purcell. Now we're ready. Did you know that Baltimore County Public Schools has five area education advisory councils? One for each area in the county. Southeast, Northeast, Central, Northwest, and Southwest. My name is Marlena Collinson Purcell, and I serve as the chair of the Education Advisory Council. The Area of Education Advisory Council were established in 1972 as standing committees reporting directly to the Board of Education to strengthen the relationship between the school system and the community by serving as an informed advisor to the board. The AEACS are there for you by being your voice to the board. Each AEAC has periodic meetings throughout the school year so that stakeholders in the county can learn about what is happening in our schools. Where can you go to find out more information about each area? Let me show you. First, go to BCPS website, go to the search bar, and type in AEAC. Then, click on the Area Education Advisory Council. Once there, you will find all five areas and you can click on to determine which topic and location of the meetings. Well, now you know about the Education Advisory Council. I hope to see you at one of the meetings during this school year. Again, thank you to the Advisory Council chairs, also to our staff who presented these meetings. Last night there was a meeting in the North East, and there was also a meeting in the Southwest, um, and staff was there to present to the parents. So I'd like to also um, give kudos to our staff for, for preparing and coming to those meetings, um, and I look forward to our continued work together. Next on the agenda is student board report, and for that, I call Ms. Hassan. Thank you. So good evening, everyone, and happy new year. Before we begin, I want to send out an endless amount of my love and support to Lansdowne High School and their respective community. Today, Lansdowne experienced threats to their safety, and I send my prayers to every student impacted. Board members, I want you to understand the immense amount of trauma our schools and our students experience. This is not just a headline or a point or a check mark. This is the reality that our students and staff face. And it's terrifying. I've discussed the importance of school safety countless times before, but this time I hope you hear the truth behind what our students are feeling in this moment. We have students who will inevitably talk to their families tonight about not going to school tomorrow from, as a result of anxiety, regardless of where they are. We will all walk into our buildings tomorrow concerned about our friends at Lansdowne, but we will also walk into our buildings afraid that this happens to us and to our communities. Events like these are not far away from us and from our table, but they are also not a reflection of all of our students nor all of our schools. We must remember our community and why we are here, which is to fight for our students and minimize the systemic causes of these events to the best of our ability. I send immense, uh, an immense amount of my respect and love to the Lansdowne High School principal, Ms. Seymour, and to every student impacted. I vow to do my part in ensuring that we are actively aware of how we can serve our students after these events and before these events even occur. Despite this, as we welcome the new year, we welcome it with optimism and, and an immense amount of passion for our schools. 2023 will be a year of prosperity because of the consistent and immeasurable power of our students. The first board meeting of the new year also begins the county's budget process and ensures that our primary focus 
remains on the students and their needs. This year, I want to ensure that every student is represented on the budget. This year, I will be a staunch advocate for increasing mental health resources in our schools because it is an absolute necessity that we increase the resources we have available in order to ensure the wellness and safety of our students. We must increase the number of school psychologists and school social workers and increase access to those resources. As it stands, school psychologists has a set, have a set number of cases in which they make assist and support. However, those psychologists are not present every day, nor is every student given open access to those resources. We must support the rigorous hiring of additional school psychologists, appropriate compensation, and open access to every single school in Baltimore County. With this comes an option for vir virtual therapy opportunities for students in the VLP and other unique cases. As we discuss school safety, we also must come to terms with the fact that school safety is often a direct result of the mental wellness of our students. As we experience a substantial amount of threats to our school safety, we must look at the root causes of those issues, and it is that our students are not adequately able to understand and navigate their emotions. It is for those reasons that I ask that we all prioritize the importance of mental health within our budget this year. Over the past month, since my last report, I visited Patapsco High School, Sparks Elementary School, 5th District Elementary School, Western Tech, Catonsville High, Arbutus Middle, Pikesville Middle and High, Lansdowne Middle and High, and Battle Monument School. Each of these schools have a s unique set of needs and students, but all of them are essential to our action on this board. These schools have reminded me why I am here, and I encourage you to see your schools, their needs, and act in correspondence. I've seen the beauty of our schools just as I've seen their struggles and their respective needs. <laughs> as I've seen our schools, I can strongly share with you that it is the students that we may not see regularly that require our unwavering support. ESOL students require our support. Students with disabilities must have access to adaptable resources to ensure their education. In hearing the request for boundary studies today, as a result of overcrowding, I ask that we consider the hiring of an independent boundary analyst for Baltimore County Public Schools in order to become actively aware of our schools and their needs as our population changes. I know that our students are passionate about seeing change, but I also know that our educators are actively seeking out positive change, and we must support them to the best of our ability. Board members, we are in a position of immense privilege. We sit on this dais, but I also see our schools and our students. I may not have a vote this year on the budget, but my voice is the voice of 111,000 students. And I implore you to hear them, because my seat is not only my own. It is theirs, and I intend to be their advocate, just as I have been for the past six months. I hope, I hope your seat is one that is extended to them. I would also like to thank Madam Chair Lichter for allowing me to serve in a greater capacity as the board's Legislative and Governmental Affairs Committee Chair, and I'm excited to share with you updates in the future regarding the Maryland General Assembly's initiative and our actions in correspondence. Just like every board meeting entering in the new year, I want to take the time to thank our students and staff for making our schools strong. This year, this new year, I am student strong. And for the first time in 2023, Let's get in good trouble, in necessary trouble. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Hassan. The next item on the agenda is the work session on the proposed FY 2024 county capital budget. And for that, I call on Mr. Hartlove and Mr. Dixit. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. My name is Pete Dixit, and I'm joined here uh, with Mr. Hartlow, Chief Financial Officer, and a team member, Mr. Merrill Plate, Director of Construction and Improvement, and in the back, uh, Mr. Paul Taylor, who's the Director of Strategic Planning. We are here for a work session on the county capital program for fiscal year 2024. We'll go over a little bit of background and then a presentation going step by step as to what those spreadsheets are that we have already shared with you. The board approved state capital program um, in September of 2022. 
tonight we are, we are, we are here for county capital budget. They complement each other, so we thought it would be good to provide uh, the state capital plan so that the board members have an opportunity to correlate some of the information. The first exhibit that you have is the final approved fiscal year 22-24 state capital budget. The second one is the proposed county budget, proposed request for fiscal 2024 county budget. And the third exhibit are the schedule. It is quite a complex process, so we thought we'll share with you a schedule of different things uh, that this process contains. These documents that you see, it's, it's a lot of effort by different teams, including team member uh, from Mr. Hartliff's team, uh, Whit Tantliff, uh, Paul Taylor and his team, uh, and uh, our Diane Heckberg and Jean Armstrong, and the Facilities and Construction Office, uh, which is led by Merrill Plate, uh, and also Mike Archbold, Leslie Lazeri, Katie Angstad, and Kaylee Hopp. So it's a combined effort, a lot of folks, and I wanted to recognize them. A lot of numbers that you see, they have been put together using different formulas that the state provides in their administrative guidelines, and these numbers change. They are adjusted as more and more information becomes available. Uh, you do not have to be concerned about accuracy because a lot of people are looking at it through a microscopic lens, and if there are any omissions, if there are any errors, they are brought to our attention. If there are any updates, we make it. And then in the next meeting that we attend here for state capital budget, we'll give you an updated document. The project included in FY24 county budget are similar uh, to what were approved in the state budget and what were included in the last year's county budget. I'll highlight some of the changes. If you look at the priority seven, Northeast Area High School, Lock Raven High School has been added to this list. Priority eight, Southeast Area High School, which is the addition for Patapsco, that has been added to the list. Priority nine, which is still the continuation of a study of the southeast area uh, for middle school and or elementary school and, and or the renovation of Sparrows Point High School. And the priority 14, which is the Northwest Area Career and Technology uh, Center. These are the projects that have been added as a result of work done by superintendent and his team working with the uh, county executive and his team. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, our gratitude for the support we receive from county. They are our key fiscal partners and we are very grateful for them. Now we'll go over the presentation. Uh, the first slide here uh, that you see is the schedule. This is the state capital budget schedule. Next slide, please. This is the uh, state capital budget request for 24 that you have. And we have shared some of the new addition. I know these numbers and items are very small, but we'll go gradually one column at a time to explain what that is. This is the county capital budget schedule. So we are here just to give you reference, uh, January 10th for the board work session. In the next board meeting on January 24th, we'll be asking for your approval. And then it will be submitted to a county and they will go through the county council, county planning board, and review by other county agencies and county council public hearing, and then their work session, similar to our work session today and it'll be adopted in the county capital budget somewhere in May of 2023. So with that, we go to the next page, which is the 24 county capital budget, page number five, if you have that. 
And after that, we'll go over item by item. If you look at the orange columns, these are the state shares that have been computed by us uh, following the formula that the state provides. And each project that you see in the first and second column, first column being the priority order, second column being the name of schools, and these numbers are there. The next slide, please, is the county share of the funding for each project in these columns. The first column on the extreme left-hand side lists the priority order for each project. The priority order has been approved by the board, uh, agreed by the county, and uh, we had similar presentations in the past to get these approvals. Recommendations were prepared by superintendent and his team. The next page nine, second column is the name of schools, and I'll go quickly over that in the interest of time. The third column shows the area of the county where the project is located. In one of the previous board meeting, board had requested that we add this column. So uh, in the interest of transparency, we are indicating what uh, area of the county these, project, these schools are. The next page is shows the type of project being proposed at that school. And by that we mean, is it replacement, is it renovation, or is it a systemic upgrade, which could be electrical, mechanical roof, or different building systems. The next column is the type of approval, which indicates whether it's a planning request or F meaning construction funding request. This is consistent with, with what state requires for their submission. The next one again is farm percentages, and this was a column that was included as part of state's request in the past to, to show the farm's percentages for each school that are listed there. Total state funding share is the next column. The column after that that you see in front of you now on page 15 is if there was any prior state funding received that is included in this column. On the page 16, you will see um, the amount of state funding recommended uh, by the Public Service Construction Program to the Interagency Commission for approval. That means this is the amount that has uh, already been recommended by IAC. Uh, the next column is the state funding for the fiscal year 24 for that particular project. So project by project, we have the state share for fiscal year 24. The, the next slide on page 18 is the amount of state funding for 25 for that project based on cash flow calculations that, states, that state requires. Page 19, amount of county funding approved in the previous year for that particular project. Page 20 is the amount of county funding being requested for that particular project at this time in fiscal 2024. Page 21 represents the total amount of the county funding being proposed for that particular project. These are the spe specific project priorities from 1 to 42 for, for state and county funding are, are being requested. On page 23, or 22, if I can find it. Uh, page 23 are the general accounts. So what we see, 43 through 48, are the general accounts for which county funding is being requested for various projects throughout the county. So this, the special thing about this is these are not for specific schools but they are for countywide. That is the priority 43 through 48. We'll go a little bit about the footnote. Footnote one explains that this column shows the type of approval being requested from state planning or funding. 
footnote 2 explains that this column reflects the full state participation of each project. Footnote 3 explains that this column represents the recommendation by the PS, PSSCP, Public School Construction Program staff, to the IAC for their approval. Footnote 4 explains that the state funding may be spread over multiple years to align with the cash flow projections. Footnote 5 explains that the county funding is to be spread over two years, in this case fiscal year 24 and 25. Footnote 6 explains that the design for school will be based upon the result of the presentation to the Landmark Preservation Commission and the Maryland Historical Trust. Seven explains that at their September meeting, the board approved requesting planning and funding approval for Delaney High School. Priority number seven, which is the Northeast Area High School, replacement of Lock Raven High School was added in accordance with the recommendation of my IPASS and the Northeast Area High School study to request design funding. Priority number eight is the Southeast Area High School, which in this case is the addition to Patapsco High School that was added in accordance with the recommendation of my IPASS, which is the multi-year improvement plan for all schools, and the Southeast Area High School study to request design funding. Priority nine is the Southeast Area um, ES Elementary School, Middle School, or High School was added in accordance with the recommendation of my IPASS and the Southeast Area High School study to request design funding. These projects are still in the stage of development. We don't know what school specific schools uh, will require that, and so it's work in progress. Priority number 14 is Northwest Area CTE School was added to request design funding. So this was quick uh, overview uh, of, of what, what, what has been provided to you. And with that, uh, that concludes my presentation part. There were some questions. Board uh, and community was given the opportunity to submit questions. And uh, let me see if I can find and quickly go over some of the questions. Uh, the questions that we have received so far, uh, I will briefly explain that. One of the questions was about uh, the site for Lafarge site, uh, and there may be a motion coming there, so we want to give you a little bit of information abo about that. We have been informed of a resolution that is being introduced at the county council regarding Lafarge property. Uh, we support site acquisition uh, for all our needs consistent with our long range plans and we support uh, any acquisition. Uh, but in order to build a school any, on any site, a site evaluation must be made and that includes not only soil condition, but the traffic condition, uh, the proximity to existing utilities, site, size, environmental conditions, wetlands, floodplains, enrollment projections, and that's the key thing. Wherever we want to build a school, we want to make sure that there are students and, they, and, and the numbers are, the number of students are eligible for state funding. Um, uh, we wanted to uh, l let you know that uh, state funding eligibility for the replacement of Lock Raven High School is potentially up to 1,500 students, including the students in there. The construction of new school on any other site, including Lafarge property, will potentially be limited to 300 to 400 seats, which is, which is the seats that we have to build the, the additional capacity for. 
So the difference between the size of the total capacity of the school uh, and the 400 will, will, have, will be strictly county funded. So what I'm trying to say is that if we build a 1,500 student school at the new site, the state funding eligibility may be potentially only up to 300 to 400 students because of the enrollment projection. While we don't have all the detailed calculations yet, we wanted board to know that it may uh, mean an additional 40 to $50 million approximate calculation, additional financial uh, load on the count county side of the funding. We have not shared that information with county yet, but depending on the action of the board, we will share this information with them. Uh, the chair. other question we had oh, about was upgrading the electrical system for Lock Raven High School. Uh, even if we, uh, if the board approves construction of Lock Raven High School today and we go through the funding, the design, and construction, we are still anywhere from seven to 10 years away for construction of a new school. In the meantime, operational issues like heating, electrical, mechanical, they still have to be uh, completed if they are needed. And this has been identified as one of the major projects requiring electrical upgrade. Uh, should the board approve construction of a new high school, uh, during the design development time, we'll make sure that uh, we do whatever is required to carry the electrical system for next five to 10 years. The final third question had to do with Delaney High Schools, and I wanted to assure the community that no design for Delaney School has yet been developed. The design is in the early stage. Um, uh, superintendent is very clear about the transparent process. We have developed, or we will be developing, a community engagement plan and share the design development as we go along with the community. Any renderings that may have been seen by anybody was just the concept that architects uh, develop for architectural eva evaluation selection process, but it has nothing to do with the design of the Delaney. So we wanted to make sure that confusion is not there. We are in the starting point of the design of Delaney High School. So those were the three questions that we have received. There are no other questions, and we'll come back to you uh, in the next meeting for requesting your approval. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, we have a motion from Ms. Hen. Ms. Hen, do you wanna read your motion? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Whereas the County Council enacted Resolution 3922, stating that the PUD applicant for the redevelopment of a site out of a larger tract of land commonly known as the Lafarge Quarry shall provide a dedication of land in fee to Baltimore County of which a 40 acre portion is to be used for the construction of a vocational school. And whereas the County Council is expected to enact resolution 1-23 requesting that BCPS begin the review of the suitability of land proposed to be dedicated to the county as outlined in resolution 39-22 as quickly as practicable for use as a vocational school and whereas the recent Northeast Area High School study did not include a survey of this location. It is therefore moved that the fiscal year 2024 county capital budget request be amended on line seven by deleting the words Lock Raven from the Northeast Area High project description and replacing the C under area with TBD. And it is further moved that the board direct the superintendent to have staff conduct a study on the site as outlined in council resolution 39-22 and prepare a recommendation to be shared with the board and county council. Second Pumphrey. Okay, so now there's discussion. Ms. Hen, did you want to talk to your motion? Yes, very briefly. And thank you for that information, Mr. Dixit. Um, the county council, um, in their review of this proposed PUD, 
um, worked at a deal to acquire 40 acres of land to be reserved, and that's specified in the PUD agreement um, for the high school. And this school is located in the Middle River area. For those who are unfamiliar with it, it's literally central to three of the four schools that will be served by this um, boundary study um, proposed in the Northeast Area High School study. And um, it is also close to the fourth school, that being Parkville High School. Um, so it's closer to three of the four schools than the, um, the Lock Raven site is now. Um, what they're asking to do and what my motion asked to do is that staff look at the site, see if it's suitable for this. All of the um, questions that Mr. Dixit raised, we certainly want to have answered. And this motion simply um, keeps that open as a possibility and asks them to bring a recommendation to the board and council. So essentially exactly what Mr. Dixit states. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a couple questions, Ms. Hen. So can we ask for the feasibility study when we don't own the, when it's not our land yet, this, the suitability piece? So uh, I, I want to make sure the term terminology is right. We can do site analysis after either us or Baltimore County owns the land and Baltimore County agrees to pay for it. Uh, I want to remind the board that while we require your approval, the board does not have any fiscal authority. We are totally dependent on state and county for funding. So if there will be any requests made, mm -hmm. superintendent and his team will take it to the county to get their approval for use of any funds. Okay. And then the motion talks about a, seat, no, a vocational school. Where is that coming from? Would this be a vac vocational school only? And wh why are we going for vocation? Why is the motion talking about vocational school? So the, the multi-year improvement plan for all the schools that was developed did not indicate any uh, vocational school, uh, need for any vocational school in that part of the county. Uh, and just for the benefit of board members, uh, there are two outstanding career and technology facilities on the eastern part of the county. And there has always been a request for a similar facility in the western part of the county, which is what is included in this capital plan. Um, and, and the second part is the enrollment projections, regardless of what type of school we build. Uh, the additional seats that are needed that will be state funding eligible are in the neighborhood of 300 to 400 seats. So anything larger than that will be funded 100% by the county. And Madam Chair, I can address the vocational language that's here okay. because I, I too question that. Um, that language is found in the council's resolutions. Um, both 39-22 and 1-23. Right, but so, that wasn't part of my IPAS or the, the, the need for vocational, okay. Correct, it's it's literally the um, legal language from their resolutions and the land transfer. So I don't believe that the um, they will hold us to that. It's It's more a technicality in the land transfer than our use of it. They're in, their intent is for us to look at this study to be for it to be used for a high school site. But they do use the term vocational. Center. They use the term vocational yes. okay. um, site in their um, in the PUD agreement. Okay, thank you, Ms. Jones. Did you have some questions? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. You actually answered some of my questions. Uh, my question is on the resolution that the county passed. I believe in the resolution, the county said that Lafarge Quarry would be paying for a soil contamination study. Um, it seems like we're now preempting it and moving forward as if we have the property. And uh, Ms. Lichter just answered my other question about a vocational school. We are following the recommendations from my pass, which is a $1 million study done by the county to make sure we have equitable facilities everywhere. I live in the Northeast, a few miles from this so-called quarry. Um, and I don't particularly agree that we need to re remove Lock Raven 
academy from consideration while this is ongoing. Uh, I think this is premature and we need to move forward with the my pass recommendations and this can ongo tandem on the side and if it comes through then we follow through but I don't think BCPS should pay for any of the site assessment until the county clears it. Ms. Pumphrey. My understanding is that this isn't the first time that the county council has um, brought about a resolution to request that we um, survey this property at Lafarge. Do you know if that's correct? I have not received any request. This is the, I have heard about conversation about this property, but my understanding is that the resolution is being introduced today, as a matter of fact, and Mr. Uh, Mark? Uh, The, uh, one of our f officers here informed us about the resolution that's being introduced today. Mr. B Baysmore, that's the name I was trying to remember. <laughs> I believe that previously the county council has requested, or at least one councilman has requested that we, or that BCPS survey this specific Lafarge pro property. I actually went back and reviewed the uh, prior meeting from the Board of Education, yeah. and both Ms. Hen and a prior board member also yeah. Uh, reference that property in during that discussion that I reviewed. Yeah. So we have not surveyed any property, Lafarge or anything, just on the request of the county council. Our process indicates approval by the board first. Look at the need, whether we have curriculum need or not. Look at the enrollment projections, and then request county, who's our fiscal authority, uh, get their approval for funding. Only then we go through. Um, uh, looking at any site. And uh, as I indicated before, based on all of the information we have of enrollment projection and curriculum needs, I'm not aware of, uh, uh, of a justification for building a new high school on that property. But we will, once the board approves, if the board approves, and if we get the funds, We'll go and look at the site. We'll get a site analysis done, but it'll be a lot more than just soil analysis. We look at the same factors that I just mentioned. And I actually think that's what the council, county council would like us to do. They want us to survey, the, or they would like BCPS to survey the property before deciding on um, a finalization of uh, replacing Lock Raven High School. They're not saying that we, we can't um, request the replacement, they just would like to survey that property first. That's and my understanding. if the request comes to us, uh, uh, I'll take it to the superintendent for his advice and we'll do whatever is needed. So Madam Chair, I'm gonna ask our deputy to do the research e immediately. There was a resolution earlier by the county council and I'm gonna ask her to pull that right now so we can have that language in the resolution up by the county council. And according to what was uh, sent today, um, the date is October 3rd, Dr. Yarbrough. I want to get that language, um, Board Member Pumphrey, since Thank you, you referenced that. Thank you. Other, Other questions? I know you have a follow-up, Ms. Hen, but is there anybody who hasn't spoken yet that has a question or comment? Okay. Ms. Hen? Oh, I'm Thank sorry. Oh, okay, go ahead. Well, I believe Ms. Joes was first. Um, actually, it's Ms. Hassan, but thank you, Ms. Hen. Oh, Go ahead, Ms. Okay. Hassan. Thank you. So I just have a couple of questions just for clarification. So if the county council passed this resolution regarding the Lafarge property, um, is there any action like that it's immediately warranted by us per the county council that we have to act on, or is it up to our discretion to then you know, take the resolution from the county council and then decide our next steps as a result. So Madam Chair, I can speak to that. Oh, okay, sorry, Mr. Dixit. No, you go first. I, I was just, <laughs> Madam Chair, may I respond? Yes, go ahead. Um, the, the council's resolution or the um, PUD agreement specifies that um, there's a time limit of five years when um, if the school is not funded within five years, then the council can designate another purpose for the land and we lose the land. So that is the um, timeliness of this. Okay, and then when it comes to changing the language um, from Lock Raven to 
a TBD, does that, can we, like, would that eliminate then Lock Raven? And, like, would that, you know, no longer, like, we're, I guess, just having it as a big question mark, and then we cannot reconsider? That's a very good question. The name of Lock Raven has not been created by us. It is result of an independent study that was agreed between uh, us, BCPS, and Baltimore County government. We are extremely grateful to them for funding this study. And as part of this study, there were uh, several community meetings. Uh, and it was an independent consultant that did this study. They looked at uh, several different options. And after analyzing all of the options, they recommended to the board and to us that the best option is uh, replacement of Lock Raven High School. But should the board choose to change it? Uh, yes, board has that authority to do so. Okay, and then I just wanted a little bit more clarification on the impact of a vocational school versus you know the language of vocational school rather than just the language of a high school because I know we are you know thinking about the seats in that school and that the state may only fund 300 to 400 and then we still have 1200 ish seats left yeah. that we would still require so what is the you know what is the impact of you know using that language vocational school and then would it then postpone, like if we look at this Lafarge property, would it then postpone adding any renovations or a replacement school for Lock Raven if we need those seats? So you have a lot of questions in your <laughs> question, so let, me go, so let me go one at a time. The, <clears throat> the type of school that we build, should it be vocational edu uh, education or regular school, that is determined in conjunction with what the superintendent wants based on the recommendation from chief academic officer and our, uh, our needs of curriculum. So that's one point. And also board gets uh, input from community members. Uh, the input about a lot of things that are in capital improvement programs in the past, like air conditioning, like the need for CT center on the west side, it all came from the conversation right here at the board meeting. And then they were recommended by superintendent to the county executive and they were included. So that's about the CTE. We do not go by developers telling that why don't you take this land and build this type of school. We go by what our needs are. The second piece is building a new school. That has to be, ter to be determined based on the enrollment projections. So. Even though county funds part of the construction, major part of the construction, a lot of funding come from state. So there are state regulations about the state eligibility of funds. And they are based on enrollment projections in that part, in that part of the county or LEA. So when we look at that, we have our office of planning. They are continuously looking at what is the enrollment projection for one year, three years, seven year, and long period of time? Based on those projections, the capacity needs are in the range of 300 to 400 seats. If you build a high school, it is going to be more than likely larger than that, that high school. So state more than likely will not participate any more than what is needed out there. So that puts added financial stress on the county side, and county already has. If you look at the, <clears throat> excuse me, my IPAS recommendation, we are 2.2 billion short of what is needed over a period of next 15 years. So there are a lot more needs than available funding. So it's in the interest of all of us to use our limited fund judiciously. Sorry, last question. Um, so would it then be, would it be more beneficial to then keep the language of Lock Raven and then can we pursue outside research on the Lafarge property without, you know, formal sort of resolution just to see whether or not it would even be feasible to prematurely replace the language with a to be determined if we already know that Lock Raven may be just like, you know, 
what is recommended yeah. and you know just to hold that place and can we still pursue that research that's a very good question and i really compliment you for that question so um, that is your decision this board's decision as to whether you want to take that motion and act on that uh, but uh, what the independent consultant is recommending is to build a replacement school and there is a queue of projects waiting for that. So there is a time ele element involved in this too. If we take the project out of queue, it goes somewhere in the back of the line and we don't know when it will get the opportunity depending on the availability of fund. So I can only provide you with this information, but the decision is yours. Thank you. Ms. Harvey, you haven't asked a question yet. Just quickly, thank you for providing such detailed information. We appreciate it as we try to make the best decisions for our students. My question is, uh, the, the PUD uh, states that this is to be used for a vocational school. Uh, there is a five-year limit on its, uh, the enacting of its usage. Is it the case that if a vocational school is not built with this property, the county can elect to use it for other purposes? That is my understanding, but I'm not as educated on the PUD. Perhaps Ms. Hunt, uh, Ms. Hen knows more about it, so maybe she can set, shed some light. Thank you. Ms. Hen, do you have a response to that? Um, that's the limit to my knowledge on it, having um, read the two council resolutions. Um, that the five-year um, limit on that allows the council to repurpose the land for, at their own discretion. I, I can't speak it, um, to any other details. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn, do you have a question? I do, thank you. Uh, Mr. Dixit, um, I recall, you know, the study that got us to, to Lock Raven which is still kind of shocking to me. Um, I understand some of the logic, but it is in the central area, even though it leans to the east. Um, my question to you is, that's considered a replacement school for Lock Raven. But if we didn't touch Lock Raven and we took all of the seats that were gonna be added, cause it's gonna basically become a mega school, like a really large high school, right? We could create because the other options were new high schools. It wasn't some 300 seat school. And I don't quite understand why you're talking about 300 seats. Is that just because you're talking about a CTE school? Is that is that where I'm I'm losing no. conversation? N no. So so the first part of your question is why Lock Raven School? That came out of an independent study. Yes. The recommendation I I of, it is not right. our recommendation. It is it it came out of an independent consultant. Second part, the 300 number, 300 are the number of seats needed in the eastern part of the county. So a little bit on the north, the, the Lock Raven is in a good location in the sense it can take care of needs of the eastern side and it can also take care of needs a little bit on the north of the eastern side. So that's, so, and the key element that I see is that the sites are limited on the eastern part of the county. There are very few schools that can take larger school. Lock Raven just happens to be one. That site is a large site. So uh, again, it is not our recommendation. It came out of an independent study. Thank you. Right. Mr. McMillan. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Mr. Dixon, I, if I'm, right? Uh, Mr. Kuhn, are you still speaking? I am. I, okay. I just wanted to understand if we had the ability. I know that the study's already occurred. I think the gist of of my understanding of what Ms. Hen's resolution is, is to actually just consider that site to see if it could be used for a high school. And therefore, it would not be Lock Raven as the chosen site. Okay. I have already shared everything that I know. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. <laughs> Mr. McMillian? <laughs> Mr. Dixon, if I'm not mistaken, 
Did you say that the independent consultant looked at all options? The, the independent consultant looked at the options that he thought were available to him. Okay. He did not, he did not include Lafarge property. So if that's your question. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Ms. Jones. Thank you, Ms. Lichter. Is there anybody that needs to go before me? No, it's your turn. Uh, Mr. Dixit, thank you. You explained it quite uh, clearly. My concern is that while we move forward with the, the Lafarge property uh, in five years, say if that is not a feasible property, and, and people that know what mining does is you mine for 75 years, you dig up to 100 feet or so. In the past 15 years, Lafarge has been now dumping stuff. Uh, so we don't know if that ground is feasible for uh, construction of a school foundation, whether it has, uh, whether it's a Superfund site, whether it has contaminated soils. Uh, so going down that pathway and removing the option of Lock Raven puts us in a tight spot because we are severely overcrowded in the Northeast area. So while we appreciate the county donating this land to BCPS, we can still move forward with Lock Raven while we're pursuing the Lafarge site. And if that falls apart, we still have a backup plan. So I will not be supporting this motion resolution. I think what we have in our capital budget is um, pretty comprehensive. So thank you for your question. Yeah. So at this, okay, Ms. Demonowski. I'm sorry, I'm just really gonna be quick. Um, because this is being um, proposed as a uh, replacement for Lock Raven and it being um, pretty far from where a lot of students would be going to that are already district for Lock Raven. Would it cause a redistricting of Lock Raven if this was to be the new Lock Raven High School? So that decision has not been made yet, but uh, that will be superintendent's decision at that time once the seats are uh, available. Um, uh, and, and also, if it ever takes place, it's a community driven process. So um, uh, if you look at our redistricting policy, uh, we do not, superintendent just uh, decides to have the study done, but the study is done by, uh, facilitated by an independent consultant and communities make their own decision and they bring the recommendation to the board and board finally approves it. And if there are elements in there that board wants to adjust, board has that freedom. Madam Chair, may I add to that response to Ms. Nomanowski? I have additional information to answer her question. I'll be brief. Okay. Lock Raven was not included in the Northeast Area High School study because it's not in the Northeast. It's in the Central. The only reason it was added to this study in the first place was because the consultant named Nor Lock Raven's replacement as the solution to Northeast area overcrowding. That's the only reason it was added. There's documentation that doesn't list it. It was added once Lock Raven was identified as the solution. So no, to answer your question, Ms. Domanowski, no. Lock Raven would not be redistricted um, should another site actually in the Northeast be selected. And my, my motion does not remove Lock Raven from a possibility. It simply postpones the decision until a study has been completed of the Lafarge site. Thank you. And last comment, Ms. Mumphrey. Uh, just my, one of my biggest concerns is if there was not one but two resolutions to study this property and BCPS did not study the property, um, the, ca the council is the, has the, is is a sole authority that will eventually ultimately appropriate the the funding for this project. Um, so saying to put the they have the pressure of you know funding under the county, but they're requesting us to study this. So I think they understand that, you know they have the pressure of funding this project. Um, and also when I watched the previous meeting with this discussion, the consultant actually mentioned that. Um, if there was another comparable site in in that location, it would be great to look at that. Look at that as well. And in that location, I mean in that um, north northeast area. Okay. Um, so the consultant did mention that in the prior board of ed meeting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we are voting on the motion that Ms. Hen has typed in the chat. Um, so can we have a roll call, please, Ms. Gover? 
Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Harvey? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Dr. Savoy? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? No. Favor is five. So the motion fails. The motion does not pass. Okay. We're not voting on the presentation today. Ms. Dominowski, you have another comment? I had a question um, with regards to the, um, so when you're adding the Northeast High School, Lock Raven, the 789, and we've moved now Delaney and Towson back, what does that do to their timeline as they have been a priority um, for the board since 2016 for replacement? So this action will not change any priority for Towson and Delaney. Any other questions on the presentation that Mr. Dixit provided? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much yes, for the presentation for and Mr. answering. Winter? Yes, somebody I, I do. call I'm, me. I'm sorry, this is Mr. Kuhn, I've got one question. Okay. Um, Mr. Um, Mr. Dixit, for, for Delaney High School, I see a large request from the state for 113 million, and I don't see any additional county funding requests for 2024. Is is the expectation that because you right, it's it's two years for county funding, and in this cycle there would be no county funding for the construction of Delaney High School, and it would fall in the next cycle, or would there be zero dollars for for construction from the county for Delaney High School? So the county has approved funds for design of Delaney. We have started the design process for Delaney. As you know, it will take anywhere from 15 to 18 months to complete the design process. Once design is at a stage uh, where construction funds are needed, then we will definitely request construction funds. But the, to approve the construction fund is county's prerogative, as I have indicated before, that the fiscal the purse string are totally held by the county and the state, and board does not have any authority to grant to approve funds. Right, I, I fully understand that. Yeah. But Towson High has eighty-three million dollars in state requested funds, and another sixty-three million dollars in additional county funding. And what I'm saying is, the lady has one hundred thirteen million dollars in state funding request, but zero additional county funds requested. So I, I was wondering why. There is the discrepancy. Yeah. So we do not know any more at this point. Uh, we will continue to request funding uh, for construction of Delaney and Towson. But so far, the funds that have been approved are for design. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, consideration of board policies, second reader. And for that, I call on the new chair of the Policy Review Committee, Ms. Pumphrey. You got it? Sorry about that, technical difficulties. No worries. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Policy 1300, Community Relations, Use of School Facilities. Policy 3410, Non-Instructional Services, Transportation Services. This recommendation is presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit K. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee? So moved, Hassan. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy?
Dr. Savoy? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes, or the policies pass or something passes. Okay, the next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call Mr. Brusades. Good evening. Good evening. Earlier tonight, the board met in closed session in its quasi-judicial capacity to render a decision in Case number SD 2021 slash 2022-05. Now would be the appropriate time to confirm the action taken by the board in closed session. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's case SD 2021-2022-05 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present. So moved, Offerman. Thank Second you. Second Dominowski. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on the superintendent's proposed FY 2024 operating budget, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening. Good evening, board members. I am down here in front of you. <laughs> I am pleased to present my proposed fiscal FY 2024 operating budget to you this evening. I would like to begin with a short video highlighting our commitment to BCPS student staff and families. Would you play the video, please? Students, staff, parents, and community members are the heart of this school system. They come from a wide variety of backgrounds, each bringing their own unique lived experience to our classrooms, school buildings, and offices. Our vision, work, and investments are driven by their stories, by their goals and hopes for the future. And together, we are working to ensure that all students, regardless of their background, socioeconomic status, or ethnicity, receive a world-class education and meet their highest potential. What I'm doing is bigger. What I do for my kids now is, is life transcendent. It's, it's gonna take them further. So that it just keeps me motivated to come in here and make a difference in these kids' lives. I feel like BCP has prepared me tremendously. I feel like the events they've prepared for us so far were amazing. The teachers they provided us with were amazing and give great feedback when you need to talk to them. As we move forward together again to meet the needs of Team BCPS, we are intensifying our efforts to provide a world-class education for every student. That commitment is clear in our strategic plan, the compass, our pathway to excellence, and we are working with a real sense of urgency given the significant academic and social emotional impacts of the global COVID-19 pandemic. Our elected officials, the Board of Education and members of the community believe in our students and have a long-standing commitment to invest in the students of BCPS. For fiscal year 2024, we are focused on strengthening our course and shaping the future of our school system. The proposed BCPS operating budget highlights key strategies we will use to achieve our goals 
and outlines the needed investments to implement the strategy. It advances equity and excellence for all students in Baltimore County Public Schools. We know that the investments in schools today pays dividends for our county's future, even in uncertain economic times. When our students enter the workforce prepared, they become the engines of our economy. BCPS continues to make progress towards eliminating disparities in academic achievement. The proposed operating budget will help us continue this critical work. The work of preparing all students to thrive in their futures is not something BCPS can do on its own. Partnerships with local government agencies, community groups, and others to increase access and opportunities for all students are an essential component of this work. The proposed operating budget is a reflection of our values, high expectations for students and staff, and commitment to pursuing excellence in all areas of our work. Our collective efforts and strategic investments will help make BCPS a premier system in Maryland. So I would like to thank BCPS TV and the communication team for that inspiring and inspirational video. Specifically, I would like to acknowledge our director, um, Wende Onajala and her team. Can we acknowledge them at this time? <laughs> we can go back to the PowerPoint. <clears throat> Next slide, please. One before. There we go. As this slide uh, illustrates, our strategic plan guides our priority work and serves as the framework for the fiscal year uh, 24 budget request. Next slide. So we have come a very long way as a school system since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic began, uh, which impacted our school system. I firmly believe we are on the road to recovery from COVID-19, but know that more work is needed. Many students have shown progress, but many others need more help and time. As a result, our efforts to heal, rebuild, and recover must be ongoing. We must continue to move forward to meet the needs of Team BCPS. This year, school year, has presented some unique challenges. With the opening of schools this year, BCPS focus or refocus our efforts on improving teaching and learning for all students, specifically looking at grade bands, pre-K to two, three to five, six to eight, and nine to 12 grades addressing school climate needs so that students and staff feel physically and socially emotionally safe and welcome, collaborating with our community partners and families to support and respond to the needs. Prioritizing equitable allocation of time, resources, and attention based on student needs, collaborating across schools and offices with internal and external uh, stakeholders to ensure team success and developing effective structures and processes to stay focused on teaching and learning. The pandemic after effects have led to increased poverty, student needs, and student displacement. Uh, we were fortunate to have received millions of dollars in funding from the federal government to recover from the impact that the pandemic has had on our teaching, learning, and operations. We have used this one-time infusion of relief funding to augment summer programs, increase additional time in schools, provide tutoring for students, create a virtual learning program, provide for the mental health and well-being and support of our students and, and staff, provide employee bonuses and support operational needs. However, FY 2024 will be the last full fiscal year that this relief funding will be available to spend. There is a funding cliff, so we must be prepared to address. Additionally, BCPS is facing a challenging fiscal situation in FY24 and FY25. Economists predict the fiscal environment is likely to remain challenging as inflation continues to increase operational costs and financial forecasts 
signal uncertainty. We know that recruiting and retaining talented and dedicated employees is vital to the success of our system. Last year, with the approval of our board and county partners, BCPS was able to provide critical compensation enhancements in this current school year, FY23. However, those costs need to be funded in FY24 budget. As part of this funding effort, BCPS has committed to Baltimore County government that we would reduce expenses by at least $16 million. BCPS was able to identify over $24 million in reductions, which include realigning teacher allocations to support student enrollment, reduce central office support positions, reduce the amount of the cell phone stipend and mileage reimbursement, and utilizing salary turnover due to retirements. Last year, budget efficiencies in central office leadership reorganization resulted in a reduction of nine FTE full-time equivalencies and savings of $1.7 million. We remain committed to actualizing additional savings in central office management in FY24. So in the midst of ongoing change, the spotlight remains on our BCPS students. Next slide. Our students are counting on us, all of us, to work in tandem to meet their dynamic and unique needs. This FY24 operating budget will support our student learning whether it is recovering or excelling in the classroom. We must continue to focus on accelerating academic growth for students in all areas, especially literacy and mathematics, and innovating the way in which we teach our students. This will include reviewing class size with a focus on establishing a standard student-teacher ratio by grade level and content area, and addressing work conditions that impact educators. This laser-like focus on key areas is in direct response to the challenging needs of our system. Our student population continues to grow in diversity and we celebrate our rich and varied backgrounds. If you're looking at the slide, look at the students we served in 1986 on the left, compared with our student population this school year. We're now educating a much more diverse population. 40.2% of our students identify as African American, 7.1% as Asian, 15.3% as Hispanic, and 5.3% as two or more races. This significant demographic shift mirrors that seen across our state and across the nation. While our student population did not grow this year, the needs of our students are growing. We have a rapidly growing English language learner population and an increase in students who are eligible for free and reduced price meals. As of September 30th, our enrollment was over 111,000 students with 60 8.4 of our students eligible for free and reduced price meals. That's a 14.5 spike since last year, 14.5% spike since last year. Next slide. While mobility rates have improved from 10 years ago, they persist. Currently, one out of every five children is moving within the system during the pandemic, we saw a significant spike in FY 2020, following by a deep decline or steep decline in FY 21 and a bounce back in FY 22. So the FY 24 budget proposal takes in consideration the need to respond to demographic and mobility trends. We have seen an 80.6% increase in the number of students eligible for free and reduced price meals over the past decade. Our English language learners have grown by 228.8% overall, 
the number of homeless children increased by 56.3% over the past 13 years. Our farms rate took a steep increase last year, likely related to the pandemic associated economic disruptions and a new U.S. Department of Agriculture pilot program to include Medicaid recipients in the count. Our students receiving special ed services saw rapid growth from FY 2015 through FY 2020. Although the number of students receiving special ed education services declined with overall enrollment during the pandemic, in FY23, the population has grown. A population of English language learners has increased by 7.7% in the past year. We must continue to provide the necessary resources and supports for our English language learners to ensure equitable access to all programming. Although enrollment has been somewhat flat for the past two years, we project steady growth in the upcoming years as indicated in this slide, on this slide. So the FY24 proposed budget focuses on strengthening our course, shaping our future. It is centered on our core purpose of increasing achievement for all students in a variety of pathways to prepare students for college and careers. We know that delivering on this commitment means prioritizing investment in the most critical components now to ensure success moving forward. In addition to fiscal enhancement, we remain committed to implementing operational changes, including establishing class sizes with standard student-teacher ratios, and once again, problem-solving emerging work condition challenges in collaboration with all of our union leaders. So the budget includes funding to cover the FY23 compensation enhancements, funding for salary steps, funding to cover benefit inflation for medical retiree health and benefits for nearly or for newly proposed employees, excuse me, funding for TAPCO rate changes and ASHME retention attendance bonuses and substitute rate increases, funding from the Blueprint National Board Certified Teachers Incentive, HR training, software, and contract employees, and additionally, savings previously noted to account for new teachers replacing retired teachers over the past several years. This funding is needed to actualize in FY24 the previously negotiated agreements, including the 3.35% general wage adjustment on December 17, 2022, as well as step and longevity increases. In addition, a placeholder has been included for the ongoing negotiations for new agreements with our county associations for FY24. This funding will be offset by additional budgetary uh, efficiencies. The Blueprint for Maryland's Future, also known as the Blueprint, establishes in law the policies and accountability recommendations of the Commission on Innovation and Excellence in Education. This bill took effect July 1, 2020, and has five major policy areas, early childhood education, high quality and diverse teachers and leaders, college and career, career readiness pathways, including career and technical education, more resources to ensure all students are successful, and governance and accountability. So while the blueprint infuses significant funding into local school systems, the funding must be used in a very specific way in alignment with the plan. So in, for, in FY24, 32.2 million blueprint dollars will allow the system to invest in early childhood education, expansion of full day preschool programs, and add preschool paraeducators and pre-K classes. It also provides the expansion of the community schools to provide wraparound services to school communities, 
and adding school-based community school facilitators and health services support in 72 schools. In terms of career and technical education, workforce development, CTE site coordinators are added in this budget, as well as workforce development student programs. For our targeted support and improvement, providing reading specialists and math school-based resource teachers in several of our schools, a total of 26 FTEs, specifically for reading and math. And lastly, AP exams. Fund AP exams for all students enrolled in AP courses. Our focus on improving academic achievement requires us to increase targeted student support to English language learners and special ed students. So the budget includes additional ESOL positions for students returning to neighborhood secondary schools and additional funds for special and non-public placements. We are requesting additional positions to prepare for the new Northeast Middle School. That includes a new principal and new administrative secretary starting either the beginning of the year or the middle of the year. And additional assistant principals and support staff to respond to increasing enrollment in schools. So our budget proposal includes evidence of our continued commitment to operational excellence. Specifically, we are requesting funds to cover the transportation parent app and a mechanic, replacement of several vehicles, critical FTEs to support facilities and maintenance, additional funds to increase bus contractor fees, additional building service workers for our new elementary schools, funding for contract maintenance, housekeeping, and grounds, funding for facility support specialists, school support specialists, and funding for energy management software. The budget also includes additional funds to cover the second year of the display panel leases approved by the board last school year. We're looking forward to higher three additional information technology technicians, additional funds for our IT network, firewalls, and software licenses, funds to cover inflationary increases in utilities and fuel, HR cler clerical support and contracted employees, and an HR software license for recruitment platform, evaluation, and registration system. So our one-time expense will include funds to cover the startup and moving costs of new schools. Next slide, please. Additional funds for, additional funds for our English language arts curriculum, some funds to support the board technology upgrades in this boardroom, additional funds for, for facility space management software, and $1.5 million towards the science of reading to generate a matching award from the Maryland LEADS grant. So my request for FY24 targets critical areas of needs at levels consistent with funding in recent years. The general fund budget, next slide, which contains majority of the day-to-day -day spending for schools and offices, including most salaries, is proposed at $1.9 billion for FY24, which is 4.0% above, above last year's county funding, excluding one-time expenditures. The FY24 proposed budget for all funds, including general fund, special revenue grant funds, capital budget or capital project funds, debt service and enterprise, which is food service funds, totals $2.59 billion. So what's coming up? The FY24 budget meeting include a public hearing on January 17th, board work session on January 24th, and the board vote to adopt the FY24 budget on February 28th. This concludes my proposed FY24 budget. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams.
Board members, please provide any questions related to the superintendent's proposed FY 2024 operating budget to Dr. Williams as soon as possible and by the close of business on Monday, January 16th, 2023. Again, the work session for this will be held during the January 24th, 2023 board meeting. Whoops. The next item on the agenda is contracts award. And for that, I call on Ms. Joes, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Is she there? On behalf of Ms. Joes. It's Ms. Be, Harvey. I will be uh, representing the, the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you. Members of the board, the board's Building and Contracts Committee met on Monday, January 9th, 2023. Items N1 through N31 are being forwarded to the board, to the full board for approval. Do I have a motion to approve items N1 through N31? So moved, Hassan. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion? Yes, Madam Chair, can we separate out um, item eight? Item eight, okay. Do um, I need a motion to separate item eight? No. no, okay, so we separate item eight. So now we are going, do I have a motion to approve items N1 through N7 and N9 through N31? So moved, Hassan. I, do I need a second? Nope, okay. No seconds needed since a recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion? May I have a roll call? Whoops, Ms. Harvey? I'm sorry, can we uh, revisit uh, separating Bring. item eight from the uh, list? Right. Ms. Hinn made the request. Is there, we have some discussion as to why we're separating out. Sure, Ms. Hen, can you eight. explain your request? I, if we discuss it, if there's a motion to approve it, we generally discuss it then. So the reason for your wanting to separate it out is? To vote on it separately. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. So now may I have a roll call vote on N1 through 7 and 9 through 31? Ms. Scover. Ms. Tomanelsky? I'm sorry. Oh. I asked. I have a question. Okay. I put it in the chat. Okay. So. Go ahead. What's your question, Mr. Kuhn? Oh, you put the question in the chat? No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm trying to open the, the item um, so I'm, I'm clear. All right. So... Um, NTA 516-23, the PEPPN technology product line. Um, it's a $12.9 million contract for only two years and 11 months. And all I wanted to ask was what the actual breakdown of the spending is because it's it's not clear from what I'm, I'm looking at in the description. Do we have staff that can respond to the question? Oh, we got a lot of staff. Yes, we do have staff. <laughs> Here they come. I'm not, which number are you referring to, Mr. Kuhn? Which, five? Okay. Sorry, I'll look. That's okay, we got it, five, item five. Five, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, that, that's the that's the one. So, Mr. Kuhn, um, thank you for the question. That is information we can't provide. We that came out of the um, building and contract co committee meeting, and we're pulling that information. So that is information we can provide to the board. The breakdown, um, the, and it's the total spend breakdown for the life of the contract. And right. I'm, I'm, I see that you're you're buying. You know, four hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of Promethean software over three years. You're, you know, you're spending eight hundred thousand dollars annually on Lightspeed Internet, 
and then everything else, which is a significant dollar amount, is not really. It, it's it, it's unclear. I'm just curious as to is there a specific focus, um, as to what. Yeah. what the money is actually being spent on. So, Mr. Green, that third item, the third bullet that you just mentioned, is for um, specific purchases of software and other needs in, um, for example, CTE areas and then also magnet schools. That's typically not part of the standard IT software delivery. So we do have um, a breakdown by vendor of what has been purchased. The majority of that um, of those purchases have been done by schools directly, um, C and I, um, Department of School or Schools Division. So it's coming out through those uh, different areas. Uh, Ms. Ms. Uh, Webster, if, is there anything you would like to add? I know you were working on looking at some of that information earlier today. The other thing I can add is that um, this will also cover the supply of um, hotspots for the students that need them. Um, and it provides um, some additional software um, that is used for uh, the, uh, the BCPS TV, purchases some hardware and software through both through this soft contract. Okay, I'm, I'm curious because I thought we got our hotspots through Verizon, which isn't one of the awarded contractors. Yeah, so now so, I'm confused. Yeah, so historically, um, if you look at the spend on this contract, which we can provide, so um, the hotspots were purchased through um, Kajit, which is the vendor that Ms. Webster was referencing. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Hen, you had a follow-up? I did. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also raised concerns about this contract in building and contracts yesterday um, with similar questions as Mr. Kuhn raised because what this comes down to is $7 million in unaccounted spending. And I would feel a lot more comfortable supporting this if I had more detail on this contract exhibit. It, not so much a line item of transactions, but the buckets in which we're spending. I get that it's a technology-based um, contract, but we have a lot of those. And seven million would seem we, we should get more detail. And I appreciate staff's willingness to provide that information. Um, however, I think we need more on this um, contract exhibit to be able to justify, should we be audited and the board be asked, why did you support this contract? What is this being used for? I couldn't answer that. I could answer that for $5 million of this spending authority. So I would prefer to have more detail before supporting this contract. Um, and since we don't have that at the time of the vote, if we're going to continue with the vote, I would also ask that this one be separated out for lack of information. M Ms. Hen, at a, at a high level, I believe uh, Mr. Augusto could could go through some of the numbers if, you, if, if you'd like. Yeah, um, and again, this is something that we can provide to the board as a whole. Um, <clears throat> give me one minute here. Would there be a problem postponing the vote on this and we've received the information as a new exhibit? At the next opportunity? No, this is just for last fiscal year. Do we need a motion for that? I'm, I'm happy to make a motion. I was asking staff that if, require, yeah, so that, that they don't have to That scramble. would require a motion, Ms. Hen. Would okay. you like to make the then motion? I move to postpone the vote on this contract to the next board meeting or to January 24th. Is there a second? Second, Dominowski. Um, is there any discussion, Ms. Harvey? I'd, I'd like to hear what Mr. Augusto has yeah. to say regarding the numbers prior so, to voting. So thank, Mr. You. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Harvey. Mr. Augusto and Mr. Hartlove, my question is tying to that. Yes. Delaying this, will that cause 
any delay in services or resources to schools. We're going to check right now on the period of performance end date on the existing contracts. This is a replacement of the existing PEPM contract yeah. that we're using. The, the existing contract expired at the end of December. So we will not be able to make any purchases until a new contract is approved. Okay. And there was a question about whatever details you yes. can provide. Okay, thank you. Um, so I will give a uh, I'll start off with a breakdown of. Um, pretty, pretty. Go ahead. Okay, I will start off with a breakdown of the um, total spend, the 7.4 uh, million. 71% uh, of that um, was for um, expenses for schools, for um, CNI, and for. Um, the division of schools and the 29% was included or included IT purchases. So, um, and I can break out the um, the largest for contract spend to date. So, the largest bucket there is. Um, yes, the four million dollars of the 7.6 I believe it looks like here went to Kajit and that is as uh, Ms. Webster had mentioned um, purchases of the um, hotspots um, the next item if I look here is the um, purchase for the licensing for the safari montage licensing which um, has been sunset now, and um, the and uh, 1.6 million um, was used specifically by various schools. Um, the vendor being Clinton Learning Solutions. Go down. Yeah. Yes, and, and the safari montage was about 1.2 million. So, so far, you've at a high level, you've gone through um, four, and then 1.2, and then what was 1.6? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the rest of the uh, purchases. So there were a total of one. Twelve contracts, uh, contracts for um, with different vendors. Is the Clinton learning the Promethean boards, or is that? Is the, it is part of it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> this lecture, yeah, yes. Uh, Clinton learning was uh, used by schools to procure um, flat panels prior to the systemic initiative of putting flat panel in every classroom. So that expenditure uh, has been subsumed within the other flat panel expenditure that we're currently doing. So that 1.6 that was expended with Clinton will not occur again under this contract as it is no longer needed because we've penned another contract to cover flat panels. So we certainly can follow up with that detail, but that's kind of that's kind of at a high level, um, the answer to the question. Okay, so Ms. Hen, are you still you, your motion still stands? It does. Okay, and we can you restate your motion, please? Sure. I move to postpone um, consideration of this contract until the January twenty fourth meeting. And was there already a second for that motion? Ms. Dominowski. There was. Okay. Second, Dominowski. Okay, can we have a roll call vote, Ms. Gover? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jibs? No. Ms. Harvey? No. Ms. Hassan? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Dr. Savoy? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? No. 
favor is four. So that motion doesn't pass. So we are still going to vote on all contracts except for number eight. Correct? May we separate, may we separate number five, please? And eight. Isn't that what we just voted on? Number separated? We voted, to, post, we voted to postpone. To postpone. OK, now we're voting to separate. OK, so we're separating number we, five and number eight. We yes. don't need a motion. So let's. We don't need to vote to separate. Right. So we, we are separate. first going to vote on one through four, six and seven, and nine through 31. Correct? OK. Now we need a ro roll call vote on that, Ms. Cover. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Now we're voting on number five, the technology product line. So roll call vote for number five. Yes. Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favor is nine. So that passes, and now we are voting on number eight, the electrification of school buses. Okay, roll call vote, please. Ms. Dominowski? No. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Mr. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favor is seven. So that one also passes. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I think what we'll do is provide additional information for um, Mr. Augusto on number five, and then again, Dr. Yarbrough and team on number eight. Uh, since there were so many questions about those those two contracts, um, we'll provide that clarity. And just to remind the board, you you monitor our spending on a regular basis, and so I know these contracts look large, but again, sometimes multiple years, and to meet the ongoing needs that we have in our system. So I just want to make sure Ms. Gover has those action items for staff. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, next on the agenda is, okay, wait a second, sorry. All those contracts I gotta go through. Oh, we just did that one. Okay, the next item on the agenda is review of the Board of Education of Baltimore County public comment and attendance guidelines and procedures. As a reminder, the board added this agenda item at the December 6, 2022 board meeting. The revised document was provided to board members with recommended changes, which include allowing public attendance without having to register in advance and updated safety procedures. At this time, I will open the floor for discussion. Is there any discussion on the revisions? Ms. Joes. Thank you, Ms. Lichter. Uh, I just have a question. Does this still limit the number of public speakers to 10 and just if somebody doesn't show up, it goes to the next signed up no, person, Ms. 
it limits it to 10 and does not go to the next person. It's just the same, that procedure has not changed. Is it just the attendance then? It's that you do not have to register to come to the board meeting. So it will be first come, first serve as long as there is space provided in room 114 or in the overflow in the atrium. Got it. Thank you, Ms. Victor. You're welcome. Any other discussion or questions? Ms. Domanowski? Or motion to amend. Okay. I, um, I, uh, I motion to amend this uh, proposal under attending the board meeting in person. I remove to replace. Um, hold on a second. Let me, let me give me a sec. Okay. Here we go, sorry. Uh, under safety precautions, bullet point six, um, I, I move to strike, remove the words continue to, and replace the words with, um, and re I remove to, I, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> under safety procedures, bullet point six, I move to strike or remove the words continue to, and replace the words through an online registration form with, with, a staff representative under safety procedures bullet point six will now read members of the public will sign up for public speaking with a staff representative. There will be no option to join virtually or by phone. So you are, so the, your amendment is saying that they do not have to sign up ahead of time. Just sign up when they get here? Correct. Okay, so, um, so you made a motion for that amendment. Is there a second? Yes, I'll second that, Ms. Hen. Okay, second from Ms. Hen. Okay, discussion. So I have a question. So you're oh, saying that, it, Ms. Dominowski, that then it's kind of first come, first serve. So who can get here in time to get their name in well, quickest? If we um, approve it, I would further amend to that it would be open with a staff member mm -hmm. starting at 6 p.m. and closing at 7 p.m. So you would have, yes, you, and you would, you could only sign up for yourself. Um, you couldn't hold places in line. Um, you would have to be here in attendance to speak. And the benefit of that is? That people who are here get a chance to speak. Okay. Miss um, Mumphrey? I don't know. I like... I sort of um, was thinking already of a variation of this, so I don't know if I should speak to that or if I should... I think we need to speak to the amendment first, correct? Because I sort of agree to the amendment, but what's going to change, <laughs> if that makes sense? Okay. So I, I guess we can, I don't know, I'm not sure. We, we have to go through the first amendment first, correct? Right. Well, there can be an amendment to the amendment, but that's the end of the amendments, <laughs> just so you know. But can and we I do it at sure the same time? Heard, can we ask her? It would, it would go to... We would then process, if, if Ms. Pumphrey made a motion to am amend the amendment, we would process that one first and then go okay. back to Ms. Dominowski's. This is what my nightmares are about, that this was going to happen. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ms. I just want one more thing. I thought I heard Ms. Dominowski say that if this motion passed, there would be a further motion on this particular item. Correct. Okay, so back to Ms. Pumphrey. Do you want to make your amendment to the amendment? Do you want me to come back to you? Yes. Okay, Mr. McMillian, are you, do you have a comment, question? I can do it now. I'm oh, I, I thought you had your pink paper up. Well, I'll, I'll do it anytime. Okay, go ahead. My problem with the in person registration is if, and the four years and, and some months I've been on this board, very rarely, I can't, I can't count how many people from the southeast area have come and spoke, spoken to this group. So what's happening is they're not making that, that, they're not traveling from Spares Point or Essex or Dundalk or whatever over here in order to play this game. <laughs> Mary Taylor raises her hand. Okay, that's the exception. Uh, <laughs> generally speaking, they're not coming over here 
to play the game of, you know, am I, am, am I going to get on this list tonight? I like the idea that they can, they, in the comfort of their home, they can, they can get online, they can do that, and then, you know, they know that they're selected. If they are selected, then they can travel over here. And the piece that I don't, that, and what I, if, so if, if 10 people do that, and then X number don't show up. Let's say, you know, and we have that all the time, three or four or five don't show up. I like the idea of then somebody in attendance then has, has signed up for a waiting list. So any other 10 that do not show, that retro online do not show, then somebody behind them has the opportunity to step up and speak. So at least we get the 10 speakers in and we have the, the opportunity to be represented from throughout the county. I'm done. Thank so you. You're talking like a hybrid that you would do the online registration, but then open it up to sign well, in if, and then if only nine, like tonight we had nine, then one person from the, the sign in waiting list would be able to speak. Is that the gist of it? What? Is that, is that what? That's where I'm coming okay. from. Okay. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Christine. Can I speak to that because that sort of um, incorporates what I, the change that I was attempting to, <laughs> to make. So um, I, I would like also a sort of a hybrid situation where you register online, but if people do not show up for their online registration, we have people who come to the meeting and can be substituted um, for those who don't show that have signed up in advance online. Okay. That was the purpose of my change to Ms. Dominowski's motion. Okay. Ms. Hassan? So my only, um, so one of my, I guess, critiques on just having that, you know, you walk in and you sign up with a staff member, um, the reality is that it would eventually, you know, end up being a first come first serve thing and there are students and stakeholders and educators who are in areas of the county that are not 10 minutes away, that are not five minutes away, so it is increasingly difficult for parents with jobs, um, educators who are coming out of their schools, students who are interested in speaking to then make that first come first serve basis. And not only that, but occasionally we do have our public comments start prior to 7 p.m. So how do we ensure that we have those 10 slots filled up you know, before the board meeting starts. So we know who we're calling on, we know what they're speaking on, we know exactly from which group they're speaking on so we can truly hear their needs. Um, but I also am in support of doing a sort of hybrid option in a different way. I do think that, you know, as much as it is awesome to have in-person speakers, we also have to be cautious of the fact that not everyone has access to come to this boardroom. Um, so in order to increase access, I'd actually prefer that there be an option so if you can't show up but you have something prepared that you can still you know opt in to join by phone or still send in your public comments so that we can watch it in the boardroom and i know that you know you can send it in through email and send in your public comment to boe at bcps.org um, but the reality is it is more impactful if someone has something written out that they have spoken that they've practiced for us to truly hear that in live time. Um, and I know that some counties have also increased the amount of speakers. Montgomery County has increased the amount of speakers to 15 um, with a two minute time limit. So if that's something that we're interested in doing, that is also an option that I would be in strong support of. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, Miss, Miss Harvey, did you have a comment? Yes. Uh, I. I do believe that we want to encourage as much public participation as we can. I am concerned about respecting people's time and a first come, first serve process discouraging people from coming to sign up. Even those people who can travel and get here prior to six, because that's likely what will happen if, if 10 people can come. People will try to get here as early as they can to register, those who can't register will now have made a trip. They may participate and sit and observe the board meeting, but will not have the opportunity to speak. And so I do think that uh, in the interest of increasing participation or making sure that we fully use uh, our public comment time, uh, that Ms. Pumphrey's suggestion would be a good one to continue with the online registration and provide some opportunity for uh, unfilled slots or slots where uh, the public doesn't show up to be filled during that time. Thank you. Ms. Hassan? 
Oops, sorry, thank you. Um, and I can I can speak to this as someone who has given three public comments to the board before I was a student member. Um, there were times that you know a lot of people don't have access to that transportation to come here every time. And respectfully, we have the same people who are showing up in person. And so much love to you guys. Thank you so much for coming um, and and making sure that you know you're here and you're engaged in your community. I appreciate you so much. But it's also important to realize that there are you know we've seen students come through and they have a parent driving them here, they can't ask their, like I know I couldn't ask my mom, like hey, can you drive me to the board? And I may or may not have an opportunity to speak, so that's one thing. And also, um, my first public comment, there were actually protesters ooh, outside of the window banging on the doors. Um, so I do wanna discuss safety there and just making sure that first come, first serve means people who are willing to speak of with you know things of substance. Thank you. Ms. Joes, did you have a question? Just briefly, I think my question was asked by many people. I do support uh, equitable access for everybody, and if it, that means hybrid, that's fine. But um, this amendment actually removes online registration, so we would have no clue on who's coming in uh, or signing up in terms of ID for safety reasons. I think that's something that's an operational issue. Um, secondly, who would be the staff representative that would be signing people? So I think I, I can't support this motion, but I do agree with the subsequent speakers that have that have talked about a um, hybrid version, I think that's something I could support. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Thank you, um, and I agree with Ms. Joes. I think equity is important, and part of equitable access to public comment is making those comments available to the public. If we think about speakers that come in person to testify. Um, anyone watching our live stream or the recording afterwards has access to their comments. Um, plenty of people email us and don't have access to that feedback. I'd like to see us um, expand our guidelines for public comment to include a mechanism by which we publish those emails and that public comment like the state board does. I think that would make our um, public comment that much that richer and more robust and make people feel as if we are reading their emails and we are responding and that um, the public can see what they're sharing with us and that it's not going into a black hole somewhere. Um, with regards to um, the sign up, when I first um, joined the board in 2016, um, in person, what we're proposing, the in person sign up was the process um, and it was first come, first serve. Um, very few people showed up and didn't get a chance to speak. I was going to suggest what Ms. Hassan suggested, which is um, expand it to 15 um, for two minutes. I really like that idea. And I think if we did that and required in-person sign up, um, most people would get a chance to speak who did show up. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Ms. Domenowski. Uh, I just wanted to address the safety issue as far as the registration. We are already, um, according to this amendment, saying that you don't have to register to attend anymore. So I think that then you do need to sign in with a staff member to attend. So the same staff me member could have the um, sign up for comment oh, as well. I agree with a hybrid um, situation as well. I just, um, I think that when someone shows up here at six o'clock to sign up, they really have something they wanna say and they will be there to say something. I am um, i don't, I know it's a random process of selection, but I feel like we're still hearing from the same people um, every meeting and I would, I would like to see this, um, and I do also agree with the um, extend, um, expanding to 15 and reducing to two minutes, but I think that um, we would see more people with um, passionate speaking or something that they, have, that they felt passionately enough about. They're gonna get in their car, they're gonna find a way to get here and make their comments known. Okay, thank you. So we've got several different things that we've discussed. One is the hybrid of registering ahead, but then also being able to sign in to fill any empty slots, if there are any. Then we've talked about expanding to 15 speakers, but reducing the time to two minutes. Um, and then there's a safety concern. I think I have to go back to the chat. Ms. Hassan, did you put something about safety? I, sorry, I was about to put just a motion, like in a like an official, just the wording of a motion to amend. Oops, okay. Oh, it's a false alarm. I'm sorry. Okay. Just, just to amend the um, Ms. Dominowski's motion to include um, an option for an in-person wait list and just ensure that we're reviewing our safety procedures with that. 
Okay, but, Mr. Mercedes, where am I? Uh, well, right now, the only m motion that's on the floor is Ms. Dominowski's motion. Okay. And I hear the, the variety of uh, options being considered. Right. Uh, I would suggest that there would be a, a, just a vote just on Ms. Dominowski's motion, and then if somebody else wants to make a motion that they think synthesizes the, the, the feel of the group, that might be a good way to go. All right, so let's go back to Ms. Demonowski's motion. Is it in the chat, or do you just want to restate it? You did put it in there? Yeah. Okay, let me go back up. What time was that? 9.19. <laughs> um, okay, 9.19. Okay, so we're going to remove the words continue to and replace the words through an online registration form with a staff representative. Okay, so that, and then, so there's two parts. And then under safety procedures, bullet point six will now read, members of the public will sign up for public speaking with a staff representative. There will be no option to join virtually or by phone. Okay. And we had a second on that motion, correct? Yep. Yeah, okay, so we need a roll call vote on that motion alone. Ms. Dominowski? Yeah. Ms. Pumphrey? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Harvey? No. Ms. Assam? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Dr. Savoy? No. Dr. Hager? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? No. Favor is two. Okay, so that motion fails. Um, Mr. Offerman, did you have a question? Not now. Fine, okay. Thanks. Is there another motion that on the table? So does someone make, want to make another motion? I can make the motion. Um, I'd like to move to amend that same light on, line item, line item six in safety procedures to members of the public will sign up for public speaking through an online registration form. However, five? Um, there will no. There will be a space for ten, five to ten speakers um, on a wait list. Should they attend in person with a staff representative, there will be an uh, an option to join virtually or by phone. So this would then change it so that we would have an option for ten speakers. So let's say nobody shows up to who registered online. We have ten up to ten. Um, speakers who can come and speak, um, but also there would then also be an additional option to call in by phone, so if someone's not feeling well, they can still give a comment. Okay. I think. <laughs> can you repeat that? that? There was a couple changes. I will put that in the chat as well, um, but I'll restate it while I do that. Um, so it would the new line item would read, members of the public will, will sign up for public speaking through an online registration form, and up to 10 speakers will sign up for a wait list in person with a staff representative. There will be an option to join virtually or by phone. Okay, so let me just make sure I understand. So we still have 10 people registering online, but and then it you're saying if there are some of those 10 don't show up or you're adding another just, 10? So it's just, no, no, no. It's just, so the wait list that we talked about, so if someone doesn't show up, like today we okay. had nine, so we have one. then it would just be, we would just have that one, like the first person on the wait list, okay. which would be, we can have it randomly selected. I know Ms. Howie put in the chat that it was randomly selected yeah, by the student out of member. Box. Uh -huh. We can continue to do that or we could just have it as a first come first serve basis so we ensure that that person is still here. So in the past it was you put your name into a box and then they the student board member picked the name out. So if, so if someone got here at 6 versus 620 it didn't matter. Your names were in that box and they, then they pulled it out. So it wasn't first come first serve, it was random, which goes to if people can't get here exactly. So then there's not that that wait. Okay, this is getting very confusing. Mr. Mercedes, were you going to say something? You're just breathing really heavily. <laughs> I'm just trying to process oh. that, uh, and I'm I'm unclear on the difference between virtually and by phone. If 
Uh, That's adding a whole nother layer. Right. Um, I just feel like it's very similar. It's almost how we did the public hearing last year on the operating budget. We had um, people able to call in, um, which would be something that I think that we should continue to do if we're able to do it for um, the budget hearing, then I think we should also be able to do it for board meetings and then just remove that number um, once public comment is over. Okay, so then that's three different ways to sign up. Ahead of time, online? It would just be online and in person. However, if for whatever reason, there's you know a reason that a speaker cannot make it in person, but they still wish to speak, they would be able to call in. So if you were one of the 10 that signed up and was selected, then you would, and you some reason couldn't get here, then you would be able to do it by phone. Okay. I, I think it might be helpful to hear from uh, the person who is yeah, do, does a lot of the organizing of the registrations <laughs> and, and or we'll have a real boots on the ground uh, reaction. All right, Ms. Gover. So my concern is the the virtual calling in. Um, there's a wait list here. Um, if they are not able to make it here, then they get, pick someone from the wait list. Is what you're saying? But to have them call in virtually. I, I think three different ways of doing that is going to be confusing and it's going to be difficult to select 10 people. Okay, so then I guess we could just keep it so that um, we would have the 10 individuals on the wait list um, and then for now remove the option to give a virtual comment. And so then I'm going to reread that without the amendment just so that we can vote on that. So members of the public will, will sign up for public speaking through an online registration form. In addition, 10 speakers will be selected in person through a wait list should one, should one member not, should one speaker not attend the first person from the wait list will be chosen to speak. There will be no option to join virtually or by phone. Is there a second to Ms. Hassan's motion? Second, Pumphrey. All right, discussion, Ms. Harvey? So it sounded like you said that in addition, 10 there are still like 10. I'm going to put the official wording in the chat so it makes more sense. But if you scroll up, um, all comments are still limited to three minutes per speaker. And there are still 10 speakers per the first bullet of the speaker's document. M may I ask why we are putting a number on the wait list? I think that's causing some of the confusion. For instance, I, I, I know the general thinking is 10 people can speak. If none of them showed up, we had 10 people on the wait list. But there are occasions where people are in and out of this room. People leave early. People come late. Would it be possible to uh, change the language to reflect that a wait list will be established to uh, replace any speakers who don't show up? to simplify that language a little bit so that we're not quantifying it. Just have an unlimited amount of people on the wait list? If people come and they want to speak, they can be put on the wait list. If, if all 10 speakers show up, then no one gets called from the wait list. If two people don't uh, show up, then two people get called from the wait list. I'm, I'm just asking because I think that the, the limited number, the number 10 on the wait list is what's causing some some confusion. I can amend, if everyone agrees, I can amend my language so that it's just a free wait list with anyone who's interested. Okay. I can rescind my motion and then restate it or just amend it with, as long as I have the approval of my seconder um, to amend my motion. Sure. Okay, Ms. Dominowski. I just, for sake of trying to streamline this a little, oh, 
Sorry. For sake of streamlining this, um, I would like to um, keep the online registration and open it up to 15, but l allow unlimited amounts. Like, so you have your list of 15, you, you not, you, and then it would be two minutes, but you would contact them, say you are priority 15, and then but comment, leave a, um, send an email out to whoever else registered saying, you are not priority 15, but if there, a speaker does not show that has been called, you would be next in line. Does that to so, open so you're it up elim to eliminating more the waiting list Elimin here? Eliminating the waiting list here for less confusion, and that way we have all the names ahead of time, and we don't have to worry about having, the, having two lists, basically. Okay, Mr. McMillian, were you you had it I up? I was going to make a comment about 15. I'm in favor of 15 speakers for two minutes. That's okay. all. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gober, how many stakeholder groups do we have that speak when we do the stakeholder groups? I mean, I know I only had two, but how many could speak? Must be a big number. Okay. So there is 20 stakeholder groups that can come speak. Now tonight we only had two. Last time we had a lot more. So you're talking from zero to 20 stakeholder groups plus another 15 public speakers. But the time wouldn't change. That they'd still get two, two minutes. minutes. So it's stakeholder still groups minutes. also. I'm not. Right. Okay. Okay. So. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Superintendent. So thank you, Board. Um, we didn't anticipate this robust conversation and all the amendments, but I'm wondering if, if we want to take those suggestions, formulate what that may look like, because you're asking good questions. How many stakeholders? What if they call in? We're doing work at the board table, and I want to be mindful of the time and just say is if the board is willing, that the board leadership would take all of the comments and formulate plan B, plan C to present to the board for you to respond. Just want to make sure we have some yeah. folks present, some folks are not, some folks are online, and we're starting to add and add. And so I wanted to just kind of see where this conversation is going, uh, just so we can provide some options, option A, option B, based on the discussion today. That, that would be my suggestion. So you can make an informed decision. And then our stakeholders and those who sign up will clearly understand we spent the time and energy to really discuss it. I think the, the moral to the story is this was put in place because of COVID, some restriction. Now that we see light at the end of the tunnel, we're still dealing with some effects of, of the COVID-19. What can we do differently for the board meeting? That would be my suggestion now that we are 9.43 p.m. And, and so do we need a motion to postpone? Okay, would somebody, who would like? I can oh. rescind my motion if Ms. Pumphrey wants to rescind her second. Yes. Cool. Okay. So. Um, Ms. Demonasco, would you like to make a motion since this was your original motion? <laughs> <laughs> motion to suspend to the next meeting. Yes. Is there a second? Second, Pumphrey. Okay, can we have a roll call vote on the motion to suspend this, um, bring it back with the edits that were discussed tonight? Ms. Gover. Can I just call for unanimous consent? Wait, do we need a motion for that? No, you just call for unanimous consent, and if there are any objections, then we would do a roll call. So, any objection? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, can we call for unanimous consent? <laughs> Everyone in favor say aye. I guess that's how it's we do it. It's just if there, you just ask, like, oh. are there any okay, objections? Okay, anybody have any objections? Okay, okay. it's passed. Done. Okay. Fine. <laughs> okay, let me look at my <laughs> script. Ah! Okay. All right. Um, so, the next part is just um, informational pieces that are included in the board docs, which include the calendar, revised superintendent's rule 3126, 3127, um, and 4011, and the third party billing annual report. Um, the other piece, uh, it, the, okay, wait a second. Mr. Kuhn just texted. 
um, came in with a question. Are you adding a close? Oh, okay, wait a second. All right, the last part of the agenda are board member comments and agenda, agenda setting, realizing it's 945. Let me go quickly. I think um, we were doing it in reverse order. So Mr. Kuhn, do you have any comments or agenda items? Good night, everyone. Dr. Hager, I don't think she's on. I'm Dr. Savoy. Okay. Was, but that's okay. Never mind. No, did you have something you wanted to say? No, just okay. that um, think of ways we can keep our students safe while they're in school because we're definitely in a crisis situation here with all the um, mishaps and especially with the six-year-old that even though it didn't happen here, it could happen here who shot the teacher. Okay, okay that's it. Thank have you. Have a good week. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Offerman, I think, is off. Um, Ms. Hassan? I have no further comments and agenda setting, especially considering that we are actually surprisingly right on schedule. Um, so I will pass it on to Ms. Harvey. Any? I do not have any agenda items. I'd like to wish everyone a happy new year uh, and uh, say thank you for your patience as we diligently work to do the work of the board. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? Yeah, I just want to add that uh, the audit committee will meet next Tuesday prior to the budgetary meeting. So the audit committee is at 430. We're going to try to accomplish what we need to by 530. And then the board meeting starts at 630, uh, unless it, we add the, the close piece. To add it at the end. Oh, the close is going to be at the end. Okay. So, so audit's so going to be good. 430 to maybe 530. And then the board's meeting's at 630. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mumphrey, do you have anything? No, I don't have anything. Thank you. Ms. Domenowski? I just wanted to reiterate what was said at the last meeting about um, the cell phone policy and ways that we can enforce this uh, more, better. <laughs> I did that again. Uh, better throughout <laughs> all BCS schools. Thank you. Ms. Hen? Thank you. Um, I've asked the leadership of the Budget Committee, Ms. Domanowski and Mr. McMillian, um, for some agenda items for the Budget Committee, but I think some of these may be um, good topics for the full board to consider. Um, one is the a status um, presentation on the Public Works implementation and the financial, a financial report of the implementation of the recommendations. Um, secondly, a um, report on the reconciliation processes with Baltimore County government throughout the year. Um, partly for education of the public and also the board. Um, thirdly, a um, presentation and discussion on the full implementation of CEP, the community eligibility provision, as Dr. Hager had requested previously. Um, also, an update and regular reporting on multi-year project spending. Um, I'd like to um, the board to receive on at least a quarterly basis a breakdown by department, division, and project for projects that span um, across multiple years, um, their project budgets um, broken out with projected and actual expenditures. Um, next, an update on MSTE's LEA spending dashboard. That's a new centralized um, dashboard to track LEA spending. Um, what's the implementation status and where are we with implementing it? And lastly, um, our pre-K funding model um, and a status on that as it relates both to the current budget and our future plans for funding. Thank you. That's all I had. Thank you. Dr. Williams? I just want to make a comment that was said earlier today. I would be remiss if I did not make a comment. I want to thank our staff and administrators and our SROs and what we have in our schools, in our clusters that respond to situations in our buildings and on our campuses. Um, we are fortunate to have that working partnership. Again, uh, the tragic situation of what happened in Virginia and certain things that are happening in our county and in our school system. But I will say uh, thanks and kudos to our staff members who are responding immediately to situations. And also I must acknowledge our students when they see something, they're saying something, and they're getting up, giving us information. And so I know Ms. Hassan mentioned uh, Lansdowne High School, so uh, I do uh, associate myself with that. Uh, Dr. Har uh, Savoy made a comment about the 
the tragic situation um, in Virginia. But I want to thank our BCPS staff, our administrators, our SROs, our partnerships with the police, uh, and our community leaders. You heard some that came today that we respond to situation, but I must acknowledge our students when they are seeing stuff or experiencing, and Ms. Hassan mentioned this at the last meeting, they are, they are actually very vocal about what's happening. So I just want to commend Team BCPS that uh, we're being diligent uh, about what we do, but we want to thank our teachers, our educators, including administrators, and our students for being visual, for being vocal, and uh, um, really supporting their schools so these things are, are not happening in our school buildings. But I, I just wanted to end the meeting acknowledging that partnership and acknowledging our students and staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Williams. Um, a public hearing on the superintendent's proposed FY 2024 operating budget will be held on Tuesday, January 17th. 2023 at 6.30 p.m. Registration to participate in public comment will be through the online registration form, which will be open on January 10th, 2023, one week prior to the hearing date and close at 3 p.m. on the day before the hearing. Monday, January 16th, 2023, Regist registrants will receive confirmation of their registration. Comments are limited to three minutes per speaker. No speaker substitutions will be allowed. To register to speak during the January 17, 2023 public hearing on the superintendent's proposed FY 2024 operating budget. Oh, you click on the link. Okay, well, there, you won't click on this link, but you can go um, and click on, <laughs> click on the link that's provided. And it is 9.51, and at this point, the next board meeting is on Tuesday, January 24th, 6.30 in this room, and we are adjourned.